we are ready to start the afternoon session. Welcome again, everybody who is uh, listening. Uh, the first speaker is Prep and Grossbold. You see already the introduction, the introductory slide on your screen. Interaction between spirals and bars in these galaxies. <clears throat> yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, it is always a pleasure <coughs> to visit Athens uh, and see distinguished colleagues and friends. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, interactions between spirals and bars, especially in disk galaxies, of course. And I will start with a short introduction. There's, of course, some repetitions in all this. Then I will discuss <coughs> the actual amplitude of these uh, perturbations uh, from observations mainly. Then I will discuss velocity fields <clears throat> uh, in, in these systems. And finally, uh, mention some considerations on the stability. Now, some of the slides include movies and they are not feasible in this installation. So I uh, can only ask you to Bear in mind and ask me personally. I have them obviously on my laptop. And if you want to see them, you can see them, no problems. <clears throat> now, uh, yes, uh, we have already seen the Hubble classification. In the local universe, if we just take the revised Shapley Ames statistics, then we see that, of course, the majority of galaxies. Uh, more than 50% are spiral galaxies. Uh, it is interesting also to note that when you look on the ratio between normal galaxies <clears throat> and barred spiral galaxies, then there is a significant difference between the classification when you use the standard visual bands and the infrared. Typically, you will see very many more oval distortions and weak bars in the infrared. And that may actually go up to 70% of, of the cases in the near infrared. In the early universe, as we have already heard, the classif this classification does not apply. Uh, they are much more chaotic. There's a much larger fraction of irregular galaxies in the early universe. Actually, when you look on the uh, star formation rate as a function of redshift, you will see that it will peak around redshift or two. And that suggests also from morphological <clears throat> simulations that the early universe is much more dominated by mergers and more violent dynamics. Uh, and that is something which, well, one have to bear in mind. Now, there's basically, <clears throat> I would say, uh, several kind of spiral galaxies. There's, of course, those which are classified as non-barred. Some of them may have weak bars inside, as you can see, uh, actually 15, let me see, this one, 15, 66, actually, <clears throat> is classified as a normal spiral, but it does in the infrared have a weak part. And that is actually a standard example of a bar which is disconnected to the inner spiral that have a 30 degree offset. Then we have, of course, a standard example of a strong bar spiral here, 1365, and a flocculant galaxy or multi-armed galaxy. Uh, 44, uh, 14. Oh, <clears throat> this is basically to repeat what we basically have heard already. Uh, there's the density wave theory. It was initiated by Lindblad as we, Bertil Lindblad, as we have heard in Professor Contopoulos' introduction. Uh, typically, these spirals are logarithmic in shape. 
and supposedly, at least according to the theory, have a cotton patent speed. Uh, they all basically. Mama, what did the life exercise happen? That some somebody has uh, his. Uh, uh, it's not muted. Because we can continue, and then we'll try to fix. Please don't don't speak. There, someone has uh, is not, has not muted uh, his uh, laptop. So. Whatever. <clears throat> uh, the standard density wave theory also have, as we have seen in the previous talk, a dispersion relation, which basically relates the shape of the spiral uh, pattern with the uh, velocity dispersion and other quantities of the galaxy. Then, as we have also heard, one problem is the group velocity, which means that the spiral perturbation have a migration uh, inwards, outward, depending on where, where it is. This basically was counter-argued with the modal theory of, of Lynn, Burton, and others, where you could reflect the, the density wave and have a, a reflected wave going back to co-rotation. Uh, there have been little discussion on that later. Of course, we also have the kinematical uh, waves, uh, which was also discussed by Bertil Lindblad. Then we have the swing amplification mechanism, manifolds. I will not mention that anymore because there's ample uh, discussions in, in this one. And as we have also heard, of course, material arm is uh, still possible if it is a very short-lived spiral perturbation. Uh, but uh, it will wind up fast, as we have heard. Now, uh, the standard models, and you will see uh, one of the standard figures of Rubin, of rotation curves, they basically have uh, exponential disks. They have uh, possibly multiple components, as we have heard, bulge halo, whether or not they are uh, symmetric is another matter. I will go not into that. Spiral and bar perturbations, typically logarithmic spirals and bars. Uh, and of course, as you, you can see here, this is the, the typical, you have seen it many times, typical components of this. Uh, again, I repeat, uh, the typical uh, consensus, consensus, I believe, is that uh, bars goes to somewhere between four to one and co-rotation, and spiral may extend from the inner Lindblad resident to co-rotation if they are weak. Typically, they are supposed to be absorbed in co-rotation, and for strong spirals, they would probably end at the four to one resonance. Now, one of the problems we want to know more about is how do we characterize the spirals. And of course, there's a number of, of basic quantities. The extent of the pattern is, of course, interesting. Uh, there's an inner and outer radius. As you can already see on the background image, it is not so obvious where to put the inner and outer radius of such a pattern. The inner radius, uh, you can argue for, is somewhere here. But is the outer radius here when, when it starts breaking up? Uh, what is the main pattern? There is a nice spiral arm going out here. Is that the outer edge? It is a complicated issue, even in, in reasonable nice galaxies. Normally, the galaxy or very many galaxies have a more symmetric inner spiral and then breaks out in the outer parts. That basically means that the definition of inner outer radius of these things are not always easy to define. Likewise, of course, you can measure the pitch angle, but the pitch angle may not either be so unique. You can see that. The, if you have a nice two-armed spiral inner structure, you can easily measure that one. However, 
in the outer part, there may be many pitch angles, uh, and it is not obvious. If you take a Fourier analysis of the pattern, it may not give you a unique answer to these issues. Another problem uh, is the strength of the perturbation, and I will go into that a little later. Uh, the basic issue is that in most images, uh, you have a problem of the mass to light ratio variation due to the different populations. There are typically young stellar populations in the arms with a uh, very low mass to light ratio, and older populations in the inner arm regions, inter arm regions. And that makes it extremely difficult just from photometry to make these estimates. Of course, then there's the pattern speed. They basically either you try to, to say, okay, good, we know that, that spirals are going to end at certain resonances. And then you say, okay, if we know the rotation curve, then we know the pattern speed if we can identify uniquely one feature to a certain resonance. That, however, is not always trivial. And then, of course, there's velocity method, method which, uh, like the Tremaine Weinberg method, Again, there it is used, it seemed to be valid in many cases. There's still the assumption on that there's no phase transitions. That is still a slight issue uh, if you discuss gas measurements, which may turn into stars. Now, the strength of the spiral perturbations, as I said, is an issue. Uh, the, the traditional way of measuring them is the, the magnitude difference between the arm and the interarm region surface photometry. There's also been similar measures, some more integral measures have been tried. Then you have frequently used Fourier and Fourier transform harmonics, uh, the, the A M equals two mode, for instance. All these have the basic problem again of the mass to light ratio. Dust extinction, where of course near infrared is or, or infrared is better, but due to the general mass to light ratio variation between younger populations and older population, there's still a, a significant issue there. Now, another way to measure these things are basically to look on the texture of the unresolved clusters in the galactic disk. Uh, this has been tried uh, earlier. There have been uh, attempts, successful attempts to measure distances to elliptical galaxies using this method where the fainter the galaxy, the less clusters you see because of the density function of stellar clusters. You can determine the, or you can measure the, uh, the uh, uh, texture variations using Fourier transforms. And uh, this I will go into just now. The other way is basically to measure it simply by stellar counts. And that is of course only possible in the, in the Milky Way. In the Milky Way, it was done by measuring uh, an eight degree uh, square degree field in the anti center direction. In the center direction, that is not feasible because there's too much obscuration because of dust in the plane. But in the anti center direction, there's much less obscuration, and therefore that is possible. Distances and the type of the stars were measured using the strong grain or color H beta photometry. And uh, that also gives distances later. The distances was confirmed to be reasonable good uh, checking with the Gaia data. That basically suggests that there is of the order of a 10% increase in density around the position of the Perseus arm. These red lines indicate the area where the sample is complete. And this one means that the 
around 10% over density is valid at between four and five sigma. Also, the distance of this increase is consistent with the MESA, MESA, MESA distances measured in, uh, in the radio surveys. And that basically suggests that the perturbation is of the order of, of 10%, the density, surface density variation. Now, uh, if you look on the texture variation due to faint unresolved clusters, uh, which is basically below the detection limit, basically below five sigma, they still provide a, a, a roughness of the image. Now that, of course, uh, needs deep imaging and it needs good seeing because otherwise everything is smeared out. But we do have such images. Now, in order to apply that method, you have typically to remove bright stars, etc. This is relative simple. Uh, you can calibrate this by simulating a power law distribution of massive clusters with different densities. And this is what you see in this uh, one. If the density is very low, you only see the very brightest cluster. If the density is slightly higher, you see more and more. You can basically use, for instance, the four lowest terms or the or minus the, the last term uh, as, a, as a measure of the granularity or the texture. And that basically, as you can see, in this graph, basically have a linear variation. It do depend on the index of the power law, of course, but basically all indications are that that is around two and that is the red curve. So it is a reasonable linear variation. There's slight trends of, of uh, saturation, but, but they are not significant. Uh, so accurate. Now, the, the galaxies we used is are those plus two more, which for some reason got lost. I will mention it later. <clears throat> you can see that this is uh, our friend, the 13, sorry, 1300. Uh, there's a number of open spirals. There's also arrow. This is the background image. Uh, there's a number of cases here with, with sort of typical grand design galaxies. Or if you look on <clears throat> what you measure, then you will see actually eight galaxies here. And these eight galaxies, for each of these eight galaxies, you see a, a blue curve, which is the M equals two amplitude of the Fourier transform. So this is a very standard measure, but in the K-band. And the red curve is the value obtained from the estimate of granularity along deprojected circles in the galaxy. And you will see that there's actually uh, somewhat differences here. Uh, there's more, in many cases, more than a factor of two differences. A typical problem in the Fourier transform method is that they often, in the outer part, reach very high values, basically because the interarm regions basically disappear. And then you basically have a Fourier transform of a delta function, which means that the results are, are unrealistic. This is, of course, not the case when you look on the granularity measure. You will see that a, a strongly barred galaxy like 1300 actually have a relative density, surface density variation of, well, in the main bar of the order of 10% up to 20% in density. This is not from 
mathematically strong is nothing like the up to 60% you get from the A band photometry. Uh, and then, of course, when, when you, you pass the, the outer part of the, of the bar, then in that galaxy, the amplitude of the spiral is, is very weak. Now, uh, the inner and the outer radius is the typical radii the typical radii of the <clears throat> of the inner and outer spiral pattern just to give you an indication all of these cases you see that that uh, the the texture estimate basically gives you uh, low amplitudes and decreasing amplitudes out whereas the the k band photometry does not do that if you look on the on the phase differences, you will see basically that there is a systematic variation between the K-band estimate and the texture estimates. And that suggests that there is a, a phase difference between the density and the position of the K-band measured location of the bar, probably due to shift in young stars formation formed in the density wave and that is actually a, a well, for many of the cases like the one in the background the images a, a systematic variation uh, in all these cases uh, that basically include that now uh, now i will turn more to the galaxy <clears throat> you have all seen this uh, plot from the Gaia data release three velocity map of the local region in the galaxy. And you will see several things. You have a very clear indication of the bar with a, a offset of 20 degrees and not the 30 degrees, which is normally mentioned. mentioned. Uh, they estimated the pattern speed to be 40 kilometers per second per kiloparsec. One issue is that they don't see any significant spiral structure, which you could assume they would see. Now, there's several reasons for that. Their radio velocities, which this plot is based on, of course, is mainly uh, representing older stars with higher velocity dispersion. Also, the less stars in the plane where the amplitude of the spiral perturbation probably is stronger. And further, there is significant extinction in the plane, which also means that they do not see many of the stars in the plane. And that can explain why they don't see any significant spiral structure, uh, not as you would maybe some indication there, but it is not so clear. Oh, one option uh, is actually to do what you, you uh, what one should do, namely to measure uh, early type stars. They are uh, interesting because they have intrinsically a lower velocity dispersion and therefore will respond better to density perturbation in the disk. Uh, you cannot take very young stars because they have had no time to, to feel the, uh, the perturbation. This is a, a basic problem. Uh, in, in this <clears throat> work, we basically uh, used uh, estimates proper motions from the Gaia satellite and distances, uh, we basically saw, and this is basically this curve, that there was a nice perturbation here you could measure. We saw no indication of any potential increase or, or velocity response, which you would expect 
or a forearmed spiral with the Sagittarius arm, Ursa Major spiral arm, which made us conclude that the Sagittarius arm, although having star formation in it, is probably not in the potential a major spiral arm. <clears throat> uh, also, you will see that the perturbations are not dramatically significant. The Basically, the velocity uh, perturbation is of the order of five kilometers per second, which means that you have to make these measurements uh, rather accurate to see these things. These five kilometers per second basically correspond to a force, racial force variation of a little less than 2% which is not a dramatically strong perturbation. You compare that with different models. <clears throat> uh, you can see a number of them here. <clears throat> we have, uh, we used an extremely simple manifold model with the dotted lines uh, and, and several other indications here. Uh, you will see that the Manifold, although an extremely simple model, uh, did not did not reproduce the velocity peak we saw around four kiloparsec from the sun. <clears throat> but still, the uh, the errors here are extremely uncertain because of the difficulties in in doing the measure. Now. One problem is that, that you can see that these models do vary, but further into the galactic center. Therefore, there is an interest in having a better description of what different models will give of velocity perturbations in the inner part of the galaxy, because that will be the only way in which you can actually measure these potential variations our counts doesn't work. There's not many thing else than, than trying to test the velocity field of these things. In order to do that, we made a, a number of models of the of the Milky Way. We basically uh, did a, a very traditional two uh, D model of the of galaxy, St very standard uh, bulge disk. Halo. Uh, then we had a spiral and a bar perturbation. The only difference between the normal uh, thing is that we introduced a cutoff uh, because they're easy to differentiate. Uh, then we used a tangent hippopotamus. Okay, the spiral may be a little violent, but, but this is what. Uh, we used a lock grid of, of this size in this range. Uh, since these things are very cheap to calculate, it was easy to make uh, models with uh, 100 million particles. Using the logarithmic, polar logarithmic grid, uh, you have a reasonable amount of particles in each grid cell, namely between three and 7,000 which actually means that you can determine the mean velocity and also estimate of the dispersion. Uh, but the mean with an error of a few kilometers per second, that is required in order to compare with observations. Although we don't have the observations yet. Obviously, the interest in using the, the polar, uh, the Lock polar grid is that uh, you have a, a, a different view of life. Uh, this is the, the standard one. Uh, you see that you have a, a inner bar here. You have an empty region here, which is the inner limit of the grids, and you have an outer limit here. You see that. This is basically the same perturbation. But you see that, of course, logarithmic spirals are straight lines in this plot. Uh, this is the bar, and this is an offset because of the a, a 
in a in a Lindbergh resonance. Uh, now, the basic issue for making, or the basic reason for making these models, were to look on the distribution function near the resonances, and of course, uh, study how that affects different models with different pattern speed for the spa. And uh, in order to compare that with velocity fields, now uh, one have to measure these ones. The Gaia velocity fields are non-appropriate uh, because they reach in the plane far enough into the center. Uh, but but well, other means will do it now. Uh, this is one of my movies, which is a standstill. Anyway, uh, these are, are one of the models with uh, with bar only. You can see the the manifold spiral very nicely here. Uh, this is the the surface density variation. This is one velocity term. This is the radio velocity term. These plots are basically as a function of time of the uh, of the model uh, it is the m equal 0 2 4 and 6 this is the noise in the model and this is the phase here you basically can uh, can see the the lines the dotted lines are different resonances Here you can see that, of course, since this, it is an imposed file, then the base differences here is basically very systematic and basically reflects the, the pattern speed. Uh, if you then look on the spile only, you have the truncation in the inner region here. You see variations which are interesting, uh, variation time variations. In the combined one, you see, of course, a, a high degree of interaction between the pattern speed of the bar and of the spiral. I should say, of course, we have a grid of models. This is just one with the Pattern speed for the spiral of 15 kilometers per second per kiloparsec, 40 for the bar. That here, because it is fixed, there's no time variation in the spiral region, and there is variation because this is in a spiral wave. So what do we want to do eventually? Uh, we want to measure velocities uh, towards the center of the galaxy. Uh, we want, in principle, to measure that we partly have done already in the center direction. The problem in the very central part is that the inner rotation curve of the galaxy is not all that well known because the bar perturbation, the amplitude of that is not all that well known. One trivial solution to that is to have two lines of sight, si uh, lines of sight more, one plus say 20 degrees, one minus 20 degrees in, in uh, longitude. If you look on the line of sight velocity or the transverse velocity, either the sum or the difference of these will cancel out the rotation of the rotation curve. And that means that these are the, the interesting figures for a flat rotation curve, or that should be zero. And then you will see variations here. Yeah, and this is a grid of models where you can see uh, different parameters variated. And you can see that certain things is very easy to 
protect that it is not the case. Others are very tricky things. And you obviously can see that. And speed is easy. Extreme values to fifty foot. Our length is more tricky. Basically, you have to reach of the order of six kilometers, six kiloparsec from the sun towards the center of the galaxy, and that is unfortunately quite far. That means. That Quite sensitive observations. Now, uh, this basically summarizes uh, here the parameters we now know. We think we know. We know. We think. We believe at least that uh, the scutum and this uh, and the precious arm are the two major arms. The arm is a minor arm. The star formation in it. But there's not any significant potential variations. Uh, the potential variation is not that strong. These five, maximum two percent. Uh, the radial radial variation of that amplitude is not very well known. Still an issue. The pattern speed. Uh, I think you can exclude values. Close to 15. Or also, there's two issues on high velocity speeds of the spiral pattern, namely that you see, as I have already shown, a surface density variation at the precious R. Also, you have H1 self-absorption, which suggests that there is a shock in the gas. Which suggests that there is a density wave at the distance of the precious R. And both of these suggest that the co-rotation is outside the precious R, meaning that high pattern speed above 25 is very difficult to reconcile. On the bar potential, we basically uh, know these things. I don't think that we in detail know and have measured the, the gradual variation and the uh, amplitude of the bar. Now, uh, another issue, and that is the, the last point I will go into, is, uh, of course, the stability. Now, there is the, uh, the Basic issue uh, is, as a bit discussed earlier, the uh, multiple pattern speeds, uh, bar and spiral, and that may supportive and be destructive. Uh, the interactions, of course, as we have seen before, sparks, cell with cell with spark, where they they interact through resonances, may be actually a, a supportive. In, model, in, model, in body models are, of course, interesting. The main difficulty is that it is for an in body model, which just have initial conditions, difficult to predict the exact shape of the spiral and bar patterns. They come as they come, basically. So we was considering to basically have a simple model where we basically insert a bar and a spiral with specific spiral and bar pattern speeds and see how that evolves, see if they were stable configurations or non-stable configurations. Uh, the other point is that, of course, as we have heard earlier today, galaxies are not isolated. They 
basically well experience major mergers more more frequently in, in earlier times but minor mergers is non infrequent you can see the Sagittarius stream that is just one of the recent examples of course such effects are very dependent on the impact parameters of such parameters and some of them may only make oscillations in the disk in the set direction otherwise uh, they may not do much harm they make rings if they hit correctly they i'm sure can make spirals if you just tune them right this is an issue <clears throat> and therefore it is not all that obvious uh, if stability over very many giga years is of any relevance in dynamic models i think if you have patterns which are stable in, in a few giga years you should be satisfied because anyway they will be destroyed by some minor merge and that makes many giga years uh, models interesting but maybe not so relevant for many of oh, so what we did was a, a very uh, trivial thing uh, we used a, a, a fixed bulge and halo comp uh, potential that of course ignores a number of, of effects uh, I think for a shorter time scale that may be acceptable uh, again there the halo spiral interactions as we have heard not a concern uh, we initiated the the velocity field consistent with the milky way model we used a, a approximation to the shoe uh, distribution function and of course we imposed by growing up a spiral and bar perturbation over the first half giga year and then we turned on self-gravity and of course we have this range of uh, I'm retired and therefore have a small budget therefore I'm interested in cheap methods and uh, free trans uh, free convolutions of polar grids as described in the uh, Vinny Tremaine uh, seem to be the perfect solution at least at a very limited range now <clears throat> that works very fast and nice no problems outside the grid of course you have a problem and there we basically applied the asymmetric potential now the advantage is, is that it is very nice and fast uh, on my my home laptop i can do uh, in reasonable short time a four to the ninth particles uh, it's okay i think again there even with a more dense grid you get enough particles even in the outer part of the galaxy to have a well-defined velocity field and of course you have the inter interest in the resolution it is high resolution in the inner part where the dynamic time scale is short and you have a low resolution in the outer parts where the resolution where the time scale is so much longer one of the major disadvantages is that, of course, in the radial direction, there's a jump, uh, there's discontinuity, and that introduces frequencies, spurious frequencies. You can solve that partly by applying having filters and other things like that. The first thing you do is actually to subtract uh, a, the, the symmetric disk form the potential solution was that because they're additive then, then you can do that and then it's smaller and therefore that minimized now again there it would have been nice to to show the movies uh, but uh, this doesn't here again you will see uh, this is with uh, with the inner bar uh, only with an initial bar 
And you will see here, there's a, a, of course, a, a, a strong response in the bar. In the outer part, there is a, a certain response. If you look on the pattern speeds, then uh, this is, of course, what it is initialized with. Uh, there seems to be a, a response here with a significantly slower pattern speeds, but not a constant pattern speed. Here's one again with a initial spiral. There you will see a, a more response in the outer part where the spiral pattern is. Eventually the combined models where you, you have again a, a significant interaction. After some time there is a, a slower pattern here, which develops. Uh, the, the very preliminary result is that of the, the bar pattern speed ends on the inner rotation curve there. Little with the bulge parameters, et cetera, you can get pattern speeds. Uh, we didn't find any longer persistent and design spirals. Cases we have tried. Uh, the, the longest time we had persistent spirals, which was not all that convincing. Uh, we still have the, the problem of spurious frequencies, as I said, and distribution function. We probably have to. Do. Well, we will check that in more detail to see if that would improve the of the spiral assist. So in brief summary, uh, I will basically say that uh, surface density variations are typically up to 20%. Anything more than that is probably not. We do see systematic phase variations between uh, the Texture variations, which I think is more close to the surface density variations than the K band. Or again, a word of caution uh, K, bar, K band or even more red observations are certainly better than visual observations. However, they still should be taken with significant amount of caution. Oh, for the galaxy, uh, we have measured the, in that sense, the Tutomarm uh, strength in the forcing, in radial forcing, uh, to, to a little less than 2%. We did not. Uh, we did not succeed in, in measuring it so far in that we could really search in the bar spiral region. That For that, you have to go significantly deeper. Uh, Gaia will not necessarily help you. They will help very much at distances and proper motions, but not in radio velocities. You will need errors of less than two kilometers. Uh, and that, that is an issue. An upcoming ESO instrument may give that possibility to say a uh, spectrograph with a large amount of, of multiplicity and in the near infrared, which would probably allow this. Uh, we was not able to see very stable configurations, at least in the checked with active disk and I will end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, questions first from the room. Okay, Christos, if Neopolis is something. 
Uh, yes, thank you for this very nice talk. I would like to ask about the shoe distribution function. So you mean uh, the velocities, you put a, a kind of Gaussian essentially with fixed dispersions and as a function. How do you fix these dispersions essentially? Uh, how do you, do you have a law for that? Uh, yeah, basically there's observational data from the galaxy and I basically was using those. So you just observe as a function of distance, let's say, and yeah, and these you can have in all directions out of Gaia with, let's say, there's local measurements of of these quantities from Gaia. Yes. Yeah. Are there variations in the amplitude of the various spiral arms in the Milky Way? Or you see always the roughly the same amplitude. For instance, what is the, could the amplitude of the Perseus arm be considerably different from the amplitude of the Scutum arm, etc.? If if the if there is a difference in the strength of the various arms in the Milky Way, this is the question. Too many. <laughs> well, and then the those that we see, <laughs> we, uh, we we have well this velocity measure from the Scutum arm. And then there is the Perseus arm, which is a stellar count measure. Mm -hmm. Exactly how you model uh, the, the, the set variation uh, is, is a tricky matter. So I'm sure that we know it very well. But at any rate, this is of the order of a few percent or one percent. Yeah, yeah, no, it's... Okay, I see. Uh, any other one uh, from the room? No, is someone else uh, that is uh, online and wants to ask something? I do is someone is a raised hand there? Yeah, uh, Merci. Uh, if you want to ask something, please go ahead. Hello, thanks a lot. Uh, Proven, very nice talk. <clears throat> I was wondering if these last results that you were showing us with the polar grid uh, coordinates have been published, if there is a reference that we can look at. Yes, yeah, oh, sorry, one more time, yes. Good, so if, if, I, if we can have this reference, it would be very nice to have, to have a look with these very nice results. The other thing is that um, we know with, with Gaia, uh, we will provide parallaxes, and of course we need um, to transform these parallaxes to distances. What, what do you use to estimate the distance to these sources? The, the, do you invert the parallax directly or? We basically use the, the Gaia parallaxes. Okay, good. And the other, the, the other thing I wanted to, to have is just a, a comment. You mentioned moons to allow spectroscopy for uh, with very precision. And I also wanted to add um, WIF. WIF is seeing the, the, the first light uh, soon. And there is a dedicated WIF and, and foremost, but WIF is coming first in the, in the north, in La Palma. It's a multi-object spectrograph. And there is a dedicated survey in the disk for um, for red clam stars and on the one side and for um, young stars, OBA stars in, in the other side for which we will have precise radial velocities. So it will be interesting to, to have a look at these radial velocities as well. I and think... we, we will reach, because it is in, in the low resolution mode with uh, to complement Gaia radial velocities, so it will go into the faint end. Uh, you, well, it, it's a matter of, of quantity yeah. of, of data because there's the variations in velocity expected for the spinal perturbations are only a few kilometers per second. You need uh, reasonable good statistics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the for the ones for the giants, we, we expect to have about a, a million uh, radial velocities in the disk from. L to 20 degrees to, to the anti-center. And for the for the younger ones, it, they have, a, 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 I think, one, an order of magnitude less, about 200,000 or something like this. 
but at, at least it will be a good a good start. I, I look forward to the data. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Okay. So if uh, there is no further questions, thank, thank you very again. And we move to the next talk. Mirela Harsula will be giving it. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my talk is about the building blocks of the spar alarms in galaxies. Uh, there is a, bu a brief uh, review of the um, theories that prevail. Uh, so there are things that maybe you have already heard in the previous talk of Christos and of Professor. But then there are also some recent, uh, less recent results from uh, our research. Uh, so today, as you have already heard, there are two main theories that prevail. For the case of grand design galaxies, like the one on the left, uh, which has no bar, it's the density wave uh, theory, according to which there are ordered orbits that can support uh, the spiral density, wave, the, the spiral arms, uh, which are uh, well-defined and symmetric, while in the case of uh, barred spiral galaxies, like the one on the right, like our own Milky Way galaxy, the theory that prevails is the manifold theory, according to which chaotic orbits can support this spiral structure. Okay. Uh, before getting on with these theories, I would like to open a parenthesis for the spiral structure in general, because it is very common in nature and it can produce uh, fractal self-similar geometrical shapes. Uh, this cannot be a coincidence rather than a physical property of nature that it is not always well understood. I'm going to give you some very uh, interesting uh, examples here. For example, Nautilus, which is a C cell. It has a logarithmic uh, spiral shape, which in fact is a logarithmic spiral. Uh, the mollusk inside this cell grows up uh, by uh, creating bigger and bigger chambers and cells of the smallest one in such a way that uh, all the shape is a self-similar logarithmic uh, spiral. When we say logarithmic, we mean that the, the radius from the center uh, makes an angle that is always the same with the, the tangent, an angle that is always the same. Okay, then of course we know that the DNA is a double helical logarithmic spiral and it is a shape that has the maximum structural stability. Uh, we know that typhons and cyclones also have a spiral shapes, and uh, this is because of the flow of the velocity of the wind. And of course, we come to the spiral galaxies where we use uh, we, we use commonly um, logarithmic spiral in order to models to simulate the spiral arms. Uh, Bernoulli gave uh, the uh, called this uh, shapes pyramidabilis, and uh, this is a photograph that my daughter has taken uh, almost a month ago. Uh, in the Vatican Museum, this is the famous Bramante chair, which uh, it was an um, architectural miracle when it has been uh, made in uh, the first time in 1505. Uh, they didn't know about the DNA uh, then, but it was the only shape that permits uh, people to go down and come up at the same time without interaction. Okay, let's go back. Da uh, let's go back to the galaxies, as we've all uh, heard this morning from um, Professor. Uh, in the case of grand design galaxies, in the beginning, astronomers believed that uh, the spiral arms were material arms, 
and were made always from the same stars. Uh, but then, due to differential rotation, these would uh, end up with very tightly wound arms. Okay, then they understood that they are uh, density waves made out of uh, some parts of the orbits of the stars that are close to their upper centers due to the gravity. And it was Lindland in 50s who pioneered the orbital descriptions uh, of this density wave theory with, with his dispersion orbits. His theory was not widely accepted at the time, partly due to the wrong belief of the epoch that sparse structure is caused by interstellar magnetic field. And nowadays, we know that th this is something that is uh, totally false. It's not true because it has very small values and it can also support uh, the uh, spiral structure. Then we have Lin and Shu in the 60s with uh, their famous uh, dispersion relation, which explained the effect of collective motion via turbative solutions. Uh, so in this... Uh, okay, in this uh, dispersion relation, there are two quantities. There is a correlation between two quantities. This is the pattern speed that tells us how fast uh, this uh, density wave rotates with the uh, pitch angle that, that tells us how open or close are the spiral arms. Uh, this relation requires more physics because it does not take into account at all the, uh, the amplitude of the perturbation. And then if we take into account the amplitude, we, we must go to the non-linear density wave uh, theory. Uh, then we have the famous uh, uh, picture of the precessing ellipses that Kalnas gave for the first time in 1973, uh, when he saw that this density wave can be made out of orbits that have um, elliptical shapes and the main axis of the uh, ellipse, uh, elliptic, uh, elliptical shape uh, is uh, precesses with the energy, with, with the radius, and can form such beautiful shapes. And he even computed the response spiral potential. Uh, finally, a in 1975, uh, using resonant Hamiltonian perturbation theory, was able to give an explanation of this force ellipticity, and he even calculated the number and the stability of these periodic orbits. He have found that there are three kind of uh, periodic orbits in uh, such models named x1, x2, and x3. And uh, by using uh, uh, action angle variables in phase space, he found these uh, periodic orbits. And from there on, there are many numerical examples uh, in uh, of these precessing ellipses in 2D and 3D self-consistent models of spiral galaxies. Back where we were, the beginning.
apologize for this. Uh, there is a technical problem in the. Πάνω δεν φαίνεται να επικοινωνεί. Δεν μπορώ να το προχωρήσω. Yeah. Όχι, 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 δεν, όχι, okay. γιατί έχω πάνω. Αν δοκιμάστε να κάνετε, να κάνετε share άλλη οθόνη της Μιρέλας, όχι αυτή, δοκιμάστε άλλη οθόνη να κάνετε share. We're very sorry for the interruption due to technical problems. So, okay, we continue. Here are some recent results of our research uh, for the uh, processing ellipses uh, in the um, for the spiral density wave using processing ellipses in a Milky Way-like model. Uh, we use um, a model that has an axisymmetric part made out of bulge, a disk, and a halo. Uh, then we use a logarithmic uh, spiral potential. And we know that uh, the spiral density waves, uh, in fact, are bounded by some physical barriers. Uh, that uh, These physical barriers are, in fact, some main resonances. So we have already seen before that in order to find the main resonance, we have to plot this figure. Uh, for the angular with the angular velocity of the circular uh, motion, the epicycle frequency, and the combination between the two of them, omega minus and plus cap over two. Uh, then, if we put a pattern speed, which is this uh, red line, we can find the, the the sections with the omega minus cap over two, which is the inner Leibler resonance. In our model, we have two inner Leibler resonances. And then the section with the angular velocity, the black curve, gives us the corotation, which is the radius where the stars have the same uh, speed with the pattern. Uh, and then with the uh, use of convenient action angle variables, uh, we have the phase space that helps us uh, find uh, these periodic orbits that, in fact, support the spiral structure. Uh, so we have the X1 family, as we see here, which is the black. Uh, periodic stable periodic orbit uh, in the middle of the black uh, islands of stability, which we see that are found all through the energies in the whole system. Then we have the X2 family, which is the red uh, islands of stability, and the X3, which is the blue dot here, which is unstable and do not support at all the spiral structure. And um, of course, we have some uh, free parameters in our problem that we want to test. This is the amplitude of the perturbation, of the spiral perturbation, rho uh, zero. It's the pattern speed that tells us how fast this rotates. And it's the pitch angle that tells us how open or close are the, um, the spiral structure. 
Now, we try uh, in this study to find some correlation between these uh, three parameters. Uh, this is another value that uh, helps us um, uh, with uh, the uh, study is the, ampli the amplitude S of the epicycle oscillation for a particularly closed orbit. And it tells us uh, how far is the uh, ellipticity uh, of the orbit from the circle. And uh, let's focus on the black curve, which gives us uh, the S as a function of radius for the X1 family, which is responsible for the spiral density wave. Uh, the spiral density wave is located between the second inner limbal resonance and the four to one resonance, as it has already been told uh, before, because there the orbits become rectangular and they can no longer support the spiral structure. And um, here uh, the S is a decreasing function of radius, as we can see, because in the other case where S is an increasing function of the radius, the epicyclic or uh, the um, ellipticity is a uh, very big of the orbits and they intersect uh, with each other and they can no longer support the spiral structure. So here we can see the very well uh, defined uh, spiral density waves made out of these precessing ellipses uh, for three different values of the pertur perturbation. Uh, so here we'll try to find the dependence on the amplitude of the perturbation. We have taken three values, 5% uh, in relation with the axisymmetric background, 15% and 30% of the perturbation. We know that in real grand design galaxies, we can find up to 15 or maybe 20%, but the 30% is a value that is unrealistic. So... Uh, let's focus now on the phase space. Uh, we see that for this case of the 5% of the perturbation, the main uh, uh, orbit uh, X1 that supports the spiral structure is stable uh, all through the energies. And so we can uh, have a very well-defined uh, spiral structure made out of this precessing ellipses. Uh, we see that uh, this uh, spiral density wave ends uh, in uh, the 4 to 1 resonance. There, the orbit uh, become rectangular. It can no longer support the structure. When we go in a larger perturbation, we see that chaos is introduced. See here, here in the phase space, outside the second inner limb resonance. But there are still small islands of stability. And that means that the X1 family is still uh, stable and it still has material around it and can support the, this uh, spiral structure. But if we go to larger values, to 13%, we see that the chaos, uh, the um, phase space is full of chaos and there are no longer uh, stable periodic orbits X1 that can support the, this uh, structure. However, we have plotted the uh, Precessing ellipses of the unstable now X1 periodic family. This is an un unrealistic model. Okay, then we want uh, to see the dependence on the pattern speed. We take three different values of the pattern speed, which are more or less realistic for grand design galaxies. And we see that when uh, the pattern speed decreases, the main resonances go to larger radii. Uh, the wave itself goes to larger radii, and uh, here for the smallest value, we see that even the amplitude of the spiral density wave becomes larger with the radius, and this is something that can be observed in real galaxies. Finally, we try to find the dependence on the pitch angle, A. Eh? Uh, we see now that uh, we have uh, taken three cases um, of some... Uh, realistic values for the pitch angle. Uh, for the smallest uh, value of five degrees, we see that there is a lot of chaos and the X1 family is not uh, stable, not anymore. Uh, so this uh, forms a very uh, tightly wound uh, spiral arm, which is not realistic. But then we see uh, for uh, the bigger values of the pitch angle that uh, we have uh, against islands of stability and the X1 family is still a stable periodic orbit and it can form a realistic, uh, very well-defined open spiral arms. Now, uh, the most interesting result of this study is uh, this table 
who it helps us uh, who, uh, find some correlation between the three parameters of our problem. So if, if we put the amplitude, uh, the pattern speed, uh, the pitch angle, uh, below which the X1 family becomes unstable outside the inner limb resonance, we can find uh, that statistically strong spiral alarms have statistically more open uh, strong spirals have statistically more open spiral arms, and spirals that spin faster can be statistically tighter than slower ones. Well, this is a result that has been confirmed um, earlier from uh, observations, uh, like this one figure from uh, Gross Paul et al. in 2002, who uh, is a figure for real uh, observed galaxies and tells us that uh, for galaxies that have uh, um, uh, stronger spiral arms, uh, they have also more open. Uh, spiral arms, uh, but this is also a result that has been uh, confirmed in the case of uh, bar spiral galaxies, like here in the paper of Athanasula et al. Now, as uh, uh, you have heard before, when we go in the case of bar spiral galaxies, there are no more ordered orbits uh, in the region of correlation. Uh, so it was a great puzzle for the ast astronomers for many years, what kind of orbits in this case can support the spiral structures. The first uh, figure uh, was given by uh, Dumpy in 1965. It was the first uh, chaotic orbit that uh, supported a spiral structure. Uh, it was in fact, uh, um, a chaotic orbit uh, emanating from the uh, unstable uh, Lagrangian point at the end of the bar. He didn't give much of an explanation at the time. And there were many years that there were no studies at all uh, for the spiral arms in bar spiral galaxies. Uh, this is a figure that we like very much, that you have understood it. It's the third time uh, that we saw this figure today because it's uh, the first time in 1996 in a model of uh, self system model of bar spiral galaxies by Kaufman and Kondopoulos that they have shown for the first time that a chaotic orbit can support the envelope of the bar as well as the inner parts of the spiral arms. They called these uh, orbits hot population at that time. Uh, and then we come to 2006 where, as it has already been, We've been told that we have the manifold, the introduction of manifold theory. Uh, this figure also that you have already seen today uh, tells us that chaotic orbits indeed uh, have velocities that are parallel to the spiral structure. And we have uh, the manifold th theory in two versions. The one is the apocentric manifolds and the other is the tube orbits of the unstable environment manifolds that gives us uh, ring-like structures and spiral arms uh, that we see in uh, real galaxies. Now, the unstable asymptotic manifolds have uh, many, uh, many interesting applications uh, in dynamical astronomy, but as well as in other fields like in celestial mechanics, because many missions have been uh, uh, used uh, in order uh, have been used uh, have uh, used uh, asymptotic manifolds in order to um, uh, uh, in order to send uh, some uh, spacecrafts in Al Hello orbits of the Lagrangian points of the Earth-Sun problem. And uh, here, for example, we see the International um, Sun-Earth Explorer mission, uh, who, who were designed uh, using uh, asymptotic manifolds uh, in order to send uh, the spacecraft in uh, Halo Hobart around the L2 point, and in order to study uh, the interaction of the magnetic field of the Earth with a solar wind. And then the same mission was sent to a comet. Uh, so here we see the um, uh, tube manifolds, the tube manifolds of the L-Sun problem around the L2 uh, Lagrangian point. And of course, uh, uh, we have the application dynamical astronomy, uh, where as you have already uh, told before, we have the Lagrangian points at the end of the bar. And uh, when uh, the invariant manifold uh, begins, uh, for example, from the Lagrangian point L1, uh, we have two directions, the one direction is uh, going along close to the bar and the other goes to the other Lagrangian point and may make many oscillations um, and uh, many homoclinic intersections with a stable uh, manifold and 
there is where chaos uh, is introduced. Uh, this, uh, also these figures, you have seen these figures before. If we take uh, uh, orbits with initial conditions along these manifolds, uh, we see that there are more uh, small epicycles with a guiding center that uh, is moving through uh, trailing spiral arms. And if the perturbation is larger, we have uh, the larger radius of the uh, epicycle and the orbit, the chaotic orbit escapes faster from the system. And then we take the upper centers, as Chris has told you before, uh, we take um, figures like that that support the spiral structure. And now if we take only a bar, uh, this figure is uh, made on the left, if we take only a bar potential, while the figure on the right is the bar spiral potential. When we have a bar potential, the apocentric manifolds, which are formed from the apocenters, uh, as I've told you before, the orbits, because there the orbits spend most of their time, can form uh, figures like that, which are uh, rings, like rings uh, with a main axis perpendicular to the main axis of the bar. Uh, these are fig uh, features that can be uh, seen in, in real galaxies. Uh, but if we have also a spire potential, then we have uh, no more rings, but we have lobes emanating directly for the, from the Lagrangian points, L1 and L2. And if we integrate these orbits for much longer time, we take um, we see that they have many recurrences back and forth before escaping from the system, and that uh, gives us figures like these um, spiral arms. And the main conclusion out of all this is that um, every dynamical system has. Um, certain paths that are formed uh, from the unstable manifolds and not only uh, from the Lagrangian points, of course, but uh, as Chris has told you, from all the unstable periodic orbits in this region and as well as the Lyapunov orbits. And so the chaotic orbits are forced to move uh, along these paths due to stickiness phenomena. And so they stay there for a very long time compared to the Hubble time, and they can support structures like these ones. Now, uh, here is another um, uh, work made for uh, uh, in a three-body simulations in order to see uh, the diffusion of these chaotic orbits when we have a third dimension as well, and we're not on the plane. Uh, so... Uh, this is the Jacobi constant, which uh, in fact is the energy in the rotating frame. And here we plot the distribution of the Jacobi constant of all the particles. And we have separated uh, the particles that move in order orbits from the particles that move in, in chaotic ones uh, using a version of the uh, Lyapunov characteristic number. So we see that uh, above energy that corresponds approximately to quotation all the particles are almost chaotic. Uh, but if we made a frequency analysis of this uh, population, of these chaotic populations, uh, using this frequency ratio, we see that uh, we have spikes uh, um, close to some uh, frequencies, to some well-known resonances. And that means that these chaotic orbits are sticky and stay there uh, for a long time. Uh, for example, in this diagram, 300 uh, units of time correspond to Hubble, to Hubble time. So we see that although they are chaotic, they can stay uh, located close to some uh, uh, well-known frequencies and they can support uh, st structures. Now let's see what structures they can support. Uh, this uh, frequency here, uh, which is a uh, three to one, uh, we, we will uh, not going to see in what kind of orbit uh, this uh, gives us. This, in fact, it's a, a chaotic orbit that if we integrate it for a short time, it gives a triangular shape like this one. That's why it gives us the three to one resonance. But if we integrate the same orbit for a long time, it gives us a rectangular shape like this one on the plane, which in fact... Um, supports the outer envelope of the bar. And if we integrate it for much longer time, we see that uh, this, this same orbit uh, escapes from the system by, by supporting the spiral structure. 
Uh, these also, the B and C, are also uh, orbits, uh, sticky chaotic orbits in well-known resonances, uh, two to one, uh, which correspond to three-dimensional uh, periodic orbits, X1, V1, X1, V2, which are well-known periodic orbits that support the, the, the structures. Okay. Uh, let's see now here uh, for um, uh, the Lyapunov characteristic number for three cases in this uh, three-dimensional system for a regular orbit, uh, a chaotic orbit, and a sticky one. So uh, the Lyapunov characteristic number uh, for the chaotic orbit converges in a positive value uh, well before the, the Hubble time. And then the regular orbit converges to zero with a well-known slope. While the sticky orbit, we see that it behaves exactly like a regular orbit. And then uh, later on, after a much longer time, it converges to a much smaller positive value. So uh, one cannot distinguish between uh, regular or sticky orbits for a long time. And so um, we can say that they have the same behavior. Uh, this sticky orbit is plotted here in the phase space using the method uh, of uh, color and rotation of Patterson and Zahilas. And the, third day, the fourth dimension is um, uh, plotted by, uh, by color. It is a sticky orbit in, the simply in a simply unstable periodic orbit of X1V1 type. And we see that after a very long time, these scattered dots here as, uh, shows us that uh, the diffusion has started, but after a very, very long time. So if we plot uh, here uh, the isodensities of uh, families of chaotic uh, of chaotic orbits, but once they have cross correlation, now we see that uh, there are uh, orbits uh, close to frequencies one over two and one over three, which begin uh, inside correlation, but they can cross correlation after some time. These orbits support the outer envelope of the bar as well as the inner parts of the spiral arms, while the isodensities of other um, frequencies uh, like the minus one to one or the PL2, which are in fact Lyapunov orbits, uh, support uh, the outer parts of the spiral arm and they stay uh, close to the plane. Uh, they don't have a very important third dimension. So we see that even if we have a 3D system, uh, due to stickiness phenomena, to the manifolds, uh, we can have chaotic orbits that support uh, the, the features uh, of the galaxy. Uh, all these have been made, of course, for one pattern speed, but as Chrysos have told you before, we have tested the manifold theory for the case of uh, two pattern speed. I'm, I'm not going to give you here more details. Uh, we have uh, seen that um, this, uh, uh, mani these apocentric manifolds, in the case we have two pattern speed, are time dependent. Uh, they go uh, in a clockwise uh, version and they can still support in most of the time uh, the real um, spirals from the potential, for the spiral potential. Now, um, a very interesting case is when uh, these two theories can coexist, like for example here in a response uh, model of a slow rotating bar, Bar spiral galaxies made by Patsy and Cigaridi in 2017. Well, there are cases where we have a spiral inside a spiral. And uh, in this case, um, the inner spiral is made, uh, can be made out of uh, ordered uh, orbits uh, from precessing ellipses according to the density wave theory. And uh, the velocity, uh, the, the, the flow of the velocity is uh, perpendicular to the spiral arms, uh, while uh, the outer spiral can be supported by chaotic uh, spiral arms, according to the manifold theory. Uh, and uh, this is something that we can uh, test, is that can be tested because the flow of the velocity is parallel to the spiral arms, and this also can be an observational tool for the observers in order to distinguish if we have chaotic or regular spiral arms. Uh, we can see um, real galaxies uh, having these features, spiral and side spirals, like this one. So this is uh, a very interesting result. And in fact, we don't know 
uh, exactly which uh, theory um, exists uh, for its uh, its uh, case of uh, of its uh, galaxy. Maybe they we have coexistence. Maybe we have the one or the other case. And as Chris has told you, there is also the case where we can have uh, uh, perturbed precessing ellipses when the bar rotates um, much faster uh, than the spiral arms. And so this is an extension of the density wave theory. Uh, so uh, the conclusions are uh, that we have two main theories nowadays that prevail. In the case of grand design galaxies, within the framework of the density wave theory, there are ordered orbits in the form of precessing ellipses that can form the building blocks of spiral arms. Uh, a study of the free parameters of galactic models ends up with some correlations that are confirmed by observations. And in the case of the bar spiral galaxies, the manifold theory of sticky chaotic orbits along the stable manifolds of the Lagrangian equilibrium points, but also uh, all the other unstable uh, periodic orbits of the region, um, as well as sticky chaotic orbits, can explain the structure of the spiral arms for the case of one pattern speed as well as for the case of multiple pattern speed of the perturbation. And our future work now is that to find analytical relations of the periodic orbits for any given axisymmetric potential in the case of grand design galaxies, and then make comparison with uh, the numerical results. Okay, thank you very much. No. Time for questions. First of all, from uh, people that are around here. Um, let's check things. Okay. Uh, it's another, as you have seen, it is a, a summary of uh, mainly what the manifold theory, in, in some cases, in combination with. Uh, the density, the, the classical density wave theory can provide us models trying to find how all this uh, can form the observed part in spiral structures in, uh, in, in real galaxies, in, at least in the nearby universe. Go completely the extent of the, like when you create the, uh, um, Manifold, you create um, sort of outer envelope. Now, when you, when you use the manifold, you create sort of an envelope of the bar, right? So can you go completely, completely outside on it? Uh, in which uh, we have not only the, uh, the envelope of the bar. Yeah, in this case, yes. It could. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now we have uh, three kinds of families. Mm -hmm. The one, uh, as you see, uh, close to the frequencies one over two, not over three, uh, supports the envelope of the bar as well as the inner parts. Uh, but the other that have uh, that are sticky to frequencies that have. Uh, negative frequency ratio, minus one over one. Well, uh, if we protest the densities of this kind of chaotic orbits, they can support the outer parts of the of the spiral arm. So we can go even far, far away from and the bar. This, can this be populated with particles? Sticky, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Looking to this figure, while well, it's a question not only just to Mirella, but uh, to all of us that we speak about uh, manifold spirals, uh, is it uh, what would you how would you comment? Uh, uh, well, a statement that uh, the part of the spirals that are 
deviate azimuthally 90 degrees from the Lagrangian point on the end of the bus, whatever can be easier described by the manifold theory than uh, the second part. Let's say starting from L1, you have 90 degrees uh, about uh, kind of uh, strong support, but the second half towards the other, the L2, let's say, it is not that this, uh, as easy to to model with uh, the, the, the orbits of the manifolds as the closer to the, emer the, the Lagrangian point from which the sparrow emerges. What would you say about that? Uh, have uh, shown before that there are uh, stable orbits, like banana-like orbits, that are uh, that can also support the outer parts. Yes. If they are the same, they model the spirals uh, efficiently. The same the efficiency of the of the uh, of the manifold spirals is the same close to the Lagrangian point they emerge as well as to the other one, or they are uh, they can produce stronger spirals closer to the emerging point. This is what I'm No, I I think on, uh, from uh, these and simulations uh, that we have shown that uh, we can uh, also support uh, uh, the outer parts of the spiral uh, arms uh, with these chaotic uh, manifolds as well as the as well as the inner parts for this specific uh, end body simulation well essentially i would say okay i mean there is a lot of speculation in all of that but Altogether, I would say that as long as you go fine with the flux tube, you don't have this long uh, epicyclic turns and so on, everything is very clear. And from that point on, you have all these phenomena that we were mentioning before, that they have to return, they have to make the bridges, they have to make the oscillations, and then everything gets quite fuzzy. So quite often, I mean, just to mention, you look to a picture of a simulation or, and you, 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 you have to be very careful whether you diversify between wishful thinking and reality on that. But uh, one of the problems we have on this is to picture correctly the density and to see the patterns. Because I mean, the way we usually, I mean, this is, this is equally true for observations because quite often the image which you get in one wavelength does not agree with the one you get in another wavelength. But even if it is a simulation where it's, you're supposed to know everything, uh, quite often just looking to the simulation itself or plotting isodensity contours and so on and so forth can sometimes be misleading. So what we found is, this is probably a critical point when it comes to comparisons of this type, is you need to have a good method. We use a pattern recognition, essentially, method to figure out which structures are real and to minimize, let's say, the danger of our wishful thinking on, on the success, sort of thinking of the theory. Okay, it is, well, I, I say also one word after the word might talk about that it's something that uh, puzzles me a bit and there was a, a nice picture of a ugc 12 or whatever uh which there, there was an uh, inner ring and there was also an outer ring but uh, also uh the the outer ring supposedly to be due to the chaotic spirals was uh, not very uh bright if I can say the surface brightness there on the other side was well, okay. We're going to discuss about that. There is uh, anyone else who wants to ask uh, something? Is uh, okay. Then we can move on. Thank you, Mirella, again. And uh, the next talk uh, will be given by Torsten Nab. Now we. I hope we don't have again the, the technical problems we faced before. Now we go to a PDF file, then we're gonna come back to our point. Let's see if things, this makes the, the trouble. Now we go uh, to a talk about uh, 
galactic clusters, which, uh, okay, the distribution on the galactic, this is an issue and it's very interesting, but also it is very interesting because the, the, the light they have, they contaminate uh, the, the near infrared observation, especially which uh, one would like to, to know exactly how much and this uh, is, uh, makes uh, the importance in burn uh, greater for the for, for writing down uh, theories. Okay, the formation of galactic cluster populations of Torsten. Yeah, uh, thank you, Panas. For... Okay, thanks for organizing this. Um, I will talk about the formation of a galactic star cluster populations. So much about Mars and spiral arms, you can see why. The, this, is, this is a picture of a grand design spiral. Among the spiral arms, you see star formation, you see the very nice H2 regions. Um, stars are formed. Now, if you would like to understand this with numerical simulation, we are still limited by we are still limited by uh, numerical resolution, and uh, so we we address we address the problem a bit more on small galaxies. However. The disadvantage is that lower mass galaxies like the SMC look like this. So they're not that regular. Still, they form star clusters. See the star clusters here, um, at age two regions and the newly forming star clusters. So the aim of, the aim of this is to, um, of this whole project which I'm presenting is to have simulations which have the capability to resolve the interstellar medium and the formation of star clusters. And we do this first in small galaxies. Um, here's an example of such a star cluster um, in the small Magellanic cloud. And um, you see the little, the new, newly forming stars um, in the center of the cluster, and then the gas is expelled is pushed away from the newly forming stars. This is because of the winds, polarization feedback, and then later on, not here, supernova explosions from the massive stars. So we would have to account for the effect of massive stars in the evolution of star clusters. Here's another example of the Milky Way of an H2 region on the left. And on the right, down in the corner, you see the effect of a, of, of a stellar wind pushing away the gas from, from the region. And um, here are examples of supernova explosions. These pictures are 1As, but the ones I'm talking about are type two explosions. They just look so nice uh, so that I can and show them. And supernovae are actually the only pro or the major process generating turbulence in the interstellar medium and providing a hot phase to the interstellar medium. This hot phase can drive outflows. And these outflows are seen in starburst galaxies, M82 is an example. And here's another one, NGC 3079. Um, but let's go back to M82 because it's so nice. You see the gas is expelled from, this, from the galaxy. Uh, this is nicely seen here, but we think this also happens in normal spiral galaxies on a smaller scale, and also in dwarf galaxies. And it's extremely relevant to explain the evolution of uh, spiral galaxies in a cosmological context. Without galactic outflows, we would not have spiral galaxies. This is a major result from cosmological simulations in the last 10, let's say 10, 10 15 years. And an illustration of this uh, uh, complex 
process is shown here. This is a galaxy mass function. And uh, so galaxy number density is a function of stellar mass. The black lines are observed galaxy mass functions and the dashed line is uh, the dark matter halo mass function. So if all stars in dark matter halos would actually form the stars in spiral galaxies, we would have to follow this line. But the galaxy mass function at lower masses below 10 to the 5 or so solar masses is, is better. So this is the effect of feedback, of stellar feedback. And this is the reason why uh, galaxy formation simulations um, have been successful recently, the last 10, 15 years, um, in reproducing something which looks like a flat spiral galaxy. Sometimes even with features, you would say, are spiral arms. Only works if the simulation managed to um, implement or managed to drive galactic outflows in the early phases of the evolution of these systems. If we don't have this, all the gases turn to the stars very early on, everything is spheroidal, and we don't have the late infall, the late continuous infall. Leah has talked about this this morning, uh, which makes these large scale, large size disks. So the downside of these simulations, partly, not all of them, but of the large scale cosmological simulations is that the interstellar medium looks a bit like this. Um, it's not pretty well resolved. Um, and here's an example from my, but actually the interstellar medium looks like this. It has structure on small scales, 10 parsec, five parsecs, 100 parsecs. It's structured, it's a three phase medium. It has cold clouds embedded in warm gas, embedded in hot, in a hot medium. The hot medium is driving the outflow. So you cannot understand star formation or star cluster formation in a direct simulation of a, of a galaxy without resolving these phases. And this is just a side note, all these phases leave, leave observational traces. Or, you know, in the you know, millimeter infrared optical X-ray gamma ray. Uh, so we're working our way forward to actually out of the simulations. So, when a supernova explodes in a dense region like here, in a cold phase, nothing much happens. If it goes off in a lower density region, it has much more impact than if it's in a very low density region, the impact is even stronger. So this means that where actually the supernova explode um, matters uh, for the impact of the supernova explosion. And you would naively say, oh, supernova explode in the birthplaces of the massive stars. But if that were true, we would not drive galactic outflows. We would not create a hot phase in the, in the interstellar medium. And galaxy formation would not proceed as we see it. No disks, okay? No extended spiral galaxies. So here's a very illustrative and very simple example. Um, it's a numerical experiment. You see on the left an edge on piece of a galactic disk. It's a stratified box. Okay. Cooling processes, everything included. But here we have a fixed supernova. It let every supernova explode at the densest region of the simulation at the time constant rate of supernova. And you see the picture, the picture below is a phase on view and temperature coded. This is a two phase medium. So this does not work. This does not, rep, this does not form a realistic interstellar medium. So we need the supernova go off in lower density regions like in the middle panel. And if we do this, if we allow for this, we can create a three phase medium. So, um, we have now taken this, this high resolution approach to a, um, uh, exported this to four galaxies, small galaxies, but entire galaxies. This is the Griffin project, uh, galaxy realizations, including feedback from individual stars. So we have a typical resolution of for solar mass in the gas phase, 0.1 parsec spatial resolution. Um, we, we sample individual stars from the gas phase. Um, sample from a group IMF. 
So in every massive star, we realize in the, in the simulation, we follow the stellar evolution tracks. So we take into account the uh, photon emission, H2 formation process in the early phases of the stellar lifetime and the correct lifetime for the given stellar mass for this. Then we have uh, dust and an interstellar radiation field to uh, do cooling in the dense phases of the interstellar medium. And also a chemical network. So this is a this is a picture of a simulation we have. These are typically dwarf galaxies of masses around 10 to the 8 solar masses. 10 million particles in gas and 10 million in stars. Relatively moderately expensive simulations, but we can actually resolve supernova bubbles you see here, dense regions, filaments, filamentary structures, uh, cold clouds. And we'll talk a bit more about this. And the other advantage of such a simulation approach is that we have um, it's very loud now, uh, that we can simultaneously follow the neutral hydrogen, this is shown here, and the molecular hydrogen, the ionized hydrogen. Um, where you can see individual supernova going off. Now, this is a this is a ten to the eight solar mass system. Now, uh, with Natalia Lahin, the postdoc at MPA, we have now gone a step forward and have done our first SMC model, which is computationally very expensive because it, this is a hundred million, so ten to the eight particles at this same resolution. Um, and I just show as a teaser. I just show the movie. And I think in a few years from now, we probably go into the regime of these low mass spirals and can address the questions you have discussed today with relatively self consistent simulation. Let me run this. On the left, you see the newly forming stars, uh, gas surface density, temperature, and pressure, edge on and phase on view. There's a ring structure developing here which is a bit of the, a remnant of the initial conditions. Um, it's not so easy to set these systems up in equilibrium, even if when you have. But this is what we're trying to achieve in the future. This is clearly a supercomputing project. This is done on the one of the world's fastest supercomputers in Russia. Um, we, one of the additional strengths of the simulation is that we have an interstellar radiation field and the strength is shown here. This is important because we need shielding. We have to account for the shielding from UV radiation uh, in the regions that are collapsing, dust shielding and self-shielding. I'll correctly follow the formation. Hold your face. Um, now, the manager of the theorist is we can turn off and on the physical processes we have included in the simulation, repeat the simulation, and see which of the processes is responsible for which behavior in the simulations. And this is what we have done here. So on the top left, you see the our traditional simulation with photoelectric heating PE and photoionization. And an, an extreme example is the simulation directly below. And this has no photoionization from massive stars and no supernova explosions. This is not what a real galaxy looks like. Okay, this is a cold, cold disk, a thin disk, no hot phase, no structure. There is there is another interesting simulation here, which is the one on the lower right. And you can almost by eye see the difference. There are no hot bubbles, there are no low density bubbles, which are hot in the simulation. And this is just because we have terminated the lifetime of the massive stars to 3 million years. So we don't let them live for like 10, 12 million or 20 million years um, as they would. We just terminated the lifetime. So they explode in dense regions still. And this has a dramatic effect on the outflow from this system. And the outflow rate is shown on the top panel and just compare the black and the purple lines, which are the ones I talked about um, in the previous plot. And the outflow rate is a factor of 10 different. 
but we basically only create outflows when we take into account the full stellar evolution of the massive stars. And the reason is that we change the densities in which the supernova explode. And the comparison you can see on the right side, the, the x-axis is density, the density where supernova explode. So in the fiducial simulation, it's densities, particle densities of 10 to the minus two, relatively low densities. All stars form higher than 100. Supernova exploded very low densities. The PEPL model is the one where we have the limited lifetime and all the supernova explode in much higher density environments. They have a much weaker impact and drive less strong outflows. Very fundamental result um, from these high resolution simulations. And you need the high resolution to actually get accurately the density distribution. Now, um, we can do this a bit more extreme. Uh, these dwarf galaxies have relatively low surface densities, but we can artificially create a starburst environment. And if we do, can do this by smashing two of these together, a classical merger simulation. See the new stars forming on the left, the gas in the middle, pressure uh, temperature on the right, and you can see these star clusters here. Okay, So we form a very reasonable population of star clusters in the simulation. Uh, we have this, we're starting to have the uh, resolution power to do this. And we not only form star clusters, but we also, before we form the clusters, we form, form cold clouds. And uh, Konstantina Fotopoulou, student, has analyzed this in her thesis. And she has identified all the cold clouds, which are molecular clouds, molecular clouds in the ocean, and plotted the evolution of the mass function on the right. The mass function actually follows a parallel mass function as observed, which is the consequence of the turbulent ISM, turbulent, turbulent structure. Turbulent structure does create um, mass fluctuation, density fluctuations. And so this looks very well and very reasonable. And we have very irregular structures for these clouds. And on the right, you can see the um, mass function at different density cuts. So we see we even have evidence and the slopes look very different at different times. Simulation, so this is an indication that the, the structure of the clouds is self-similar which is also what we would expect. And Natalia Lahan, another uh, postdoc at, at MPA, has analyzed the clusters, the forming star clusters, which form from these clouds. Um, and here's a cluster analysis example. So every colored symbol here is an identified star cluster. And uh, th these, this cluster formation which is the dots, the black dots here is the cluster formation rate and the, the black line in this plot is the star formation rate. Uh, so the cluster formation rate follows the star formation rate, but, but not all of the stars we form are in clusters. And the fraction of these two is called the cluster formation efficiency, which I will talk about later. On the right-hand side, you see a Kennecut relation, so gas surface density versus star formation rate density. And the time evolution of the system is, as shown here, it's a normal star forming system, goes in a starburst phase, forms a lot of cluster, and then it goes. Um, and here we have highlighted the, the formation of the three most massive clusters, okay? Or one, two, and three. And actually number three is the most massive cluster in the system. It's so massive that its mass resembles a globular cluster. This is a metal pore environment. So this simulation actually has provided us accidentally almost with a formation scenario of a globular cluster, which is still a major unsolved question in actually in astrophysics, in all astrophysics. So both observational and theory. And here is a movie which covers 10 million years in time only. 
and shows the formation of this massive cluster. You can see the stars on the top left. Um, there's an incoming supershell created from uh, the first cluster that has formed. And with only within 10 million years, we have the hierarchical formation of a very, very massive cluster. It's little lumps forming together, merging, forming larger cluster. Almost like a cosmological formation of a galaxy, but on small scales and very short time scales. In the end, we have the two protoclusters which merge and then form the system. And interestingly, if we, you know, with the limited um, numerical resolution we have still, but this system has a density profile which remarkably well agrees with what we would expect for globular cluster systems. The colored lines are the density profiles for the three systems we have simulated the background of globular clusters in the Milky Way. So we have evidence for a relaxation phase. In the center, we have a flat core. Um, and overall, the profile looks very reasonable. But this flat core did not form Initially, this is a time sequence of the gas surface density distribution, which is the yellow, green, and blue line, and the corresponding dashed and the corresponding uh, yellow, green, yellow, blue, and yellow, green, and blue lines for the stellar distribution. And you can see we constantly pile up stellar density, go to a peak density, then we have relaxation effects, and the cluster gets a core. Um, on this hundred year time, hundred million year time scale. The right we show dispersion radius and surface density of these systems compared to globular clusters in the Milky Way. And you see the agreement is pretty good. So this is a reasonable, uh, we not only form lower mass clusters with reasonable power law mass functions, but we also have a good picture for, for global clusters. Um, and if we compare the rotation properties, here's the velocity and the velocity dispersion as a function of radius with Gaia data. The agreement is also well, reasonably well. So the systems we have, it's pretty good. But we can do more. We can now go to the observational space. And this is, will also become relevant for our new studies on larger galaxies, which should develop spiral. So Natalia has uh, applied a radiation transfer tool to the simulations we have and created a mock HST. We can create mock HST images of the emerging system here. This is an example. And we can even create full SEDs. Oh yeah, this is rotating a bit. It's a very, it's a very low middle city system. That's why the dust is not so apparent. And solar metallicity. Um, yeah, okay. And this is a full LCD um, post processed from the simulation. Uh, the white line in the center is the LCD of a dwarf starburst, and compared to LCD of two observed dwarf starbursts. And the agreement is remarkably well over this, this whatever, three orders of magnitude or four orders of magnitude. So it seems that the, the model, the underlying model we have can be validated uh, with a lot of you know, observation input we have. So it's probably a reasonable model, but you should always be careful. And um, now we can go back and observe the cluster mass functions. So Aria has produced mock observations at different distances and compute, computed cluster mass functions, which you see on the right, stellar cluster mass functions. And you can see the effect of resolution. So if the object is further away, 50 megaparsec, and then you get the red cluster mass functions, so you get crowding. So the apparently biggest clusters become more massive. And you lose information about the lower mass clusters. And this is better if you have better resolution. I think this is um, 
also in agreement with what we would expect, but it also shows that we can still recover the slope of the cluster mass function, even at lower resolution imaging. We are curious to see how this works out now when we systems. So I'm already at the end. Um, the, the conclusion of this and the takeaway is actually that the ISM and the massive stars in the interstellar medium drive galaxy evolution, together with, of course, the cosmological infall and the dark matter content in the galaxy. The star formation itself uh, is regulated by internal processes largely, plus the inflow from the outside. And the important physical processes of setting the cluster mass, cloud mass functions, cluster mass functions, and so on, especially turbulence driven by the supernova explosions in the interstellar medium. This is a process which both sets the scaling of the cluster and cloud mass functions, but also drives outflows from forming and evolving uh, these galaxies. Simulations are possible. We can go up to, to masses of about 10 to the nine at this resolution. If we go to higher resolution, we have to rely on more aggressive subgrid modeling uh, approaches. Um, but it is possible, and I'm sure within five years, we will reach 10 to the 10. Um, so in addition, I've shown you that we have, uh, in, if we go into, into a starburst regime, we form more extreme cluster masses, and we can probably form something uh, like a global cluster system, um, which is quite exciting to me because this is one of the few simulations that seem to be able to at least go in this direction. We, we have a, with these high resolution approaches, we have generated a new class of problems because uh, star clusters are not collisional, not collisionless. So we cannot make this assumption anymore for the high density star systems. So we have to we have to put numerical techniques which can resolve the collisional nature of cluster evolution, which can also involve stellar mergers, binary stars, and so on. This is something we have to work on. And we probably need a more efficient class of uh, uh, simulation tools, which can um, cover these um, these time scales, which are seven, eight orders of magnitude in time scales we have now in the simulation. And a colleague Antti Randel at MPA has recently developed a new n-body code, direct n-body code with an hierarchical time splitting scheme. I mean, for those, maybe you might want to look at this, I like this kind of problems. Uh, so that might be a way forward. Um, they technically solve this problem. So here, thank you. Much Dustin. In some, so in some frames, uh, you have uh, shown results that uh, the scale of the frame was 1,000 parsec or, or a kiloparsec. So uh, what is, uh, uh, how good can you resolve areas like this? Can you uh, have all these uh, phenomena studied in good resolution in these scales? Let's see whether I can. Doesn't change. Oh. Okay, I do it by hand. This is the kiloparsec scale. The system has the same resolution as the other system. High resolution. This is the best we can do at the moment. Well, it is it is an area about the central kiloparsec in galaxies where all this uh, phenomena are really very 
interesting to be studied. So I think that already you can attack this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but you know, limiting yourself to limiting yourself to only the central region of the galaxy has other problems. Very problems. It's much easier and straightforward to actually try to. As I said, we are slowly getting there. Okay, uh, questions from the audience here, here, Kanak. Hi, uh, very impressive simulations. And uh, I have a question on this drop galaxy simulations that you're doing. Um, so you allow for in falling gas? No, we don't. You don't? Uh, we have, uh, not in what I've shown here, we have simulations with extended hot halos, which can cool. Uh, and we have also now starting to do cosmological simulations of low mass galaxies, but not in the simulations we have here. Okay. So, I mean, I just wanted to out of my interest because um, one of my students is working on the uh, blue compact dwarf galaxies at intermediate redshifts. And in that, we what's interesting that we found is that. They, in situ versus the ex situ, the clusters like the in the BCDs, we seem to have um, the clumps of like 10 to the 6 solar mass or a few times 10 to the 6 solar mass, really like young stars mostly. They come from outside and getting in. So, do you have a scope for looking at that? Um. Blue compact dwarfs, you said? Yeah, this is a, just a dwarf galaxy, but yeah, we do blue compact. This is Star Wars galaxy. I mean, the, the existence of globular clusters and dwarfs is kind of a riddle, um, in particular because globular clusters themselves make up a large fraction of the stellar mass. Mm -hmm. So if I have problems imagining, Imagining this as an ex situ origin, um, if in the absence of stripping, say, okay, if because the Parnax, for example, six globular clusters, but the galaxy itself, most of the stellar mass is in global, a significant fraction is that if they were accreted, they would have to be accreted from smaller subunits. and. The only solution I would see is that the smaller subunits were the global clusters themselves, which is not <laughs> excluded, but I find it very difficult to imagine. If you have stripping, then of course you could have a larger, you could have had a larger galaxy. Where the other parts are stripped, global clusters are like that. That's possible. And uh, one quick one the, how do you know that these are like globular clusters? What properties that you see? Is under the mass distribution, or is it the, the cluster that you form are in what sense they're a globular cluster? Why not just a star cluster, super cluster? Um, they, 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 we think they could be globular cluster progenitors because they form in a low, form in a low metallicity environment, and they have high masses, and what we know from, and they have a structure. Which, which would in principle allow them to survive in a galactic halo, for example, or for Hubble time. We know this from n-body simulations. So we, if, we take, if you take an n-body simulation with a very similar initial condition, very similar initial density profile, and you know that these would survive. Okay? They're compact enough and massive enough so that they would survive in the tidal field of a massive galaxy. If on the right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there is uh, nobody else around, I we don't see anything else to be. Okay. So uh, we are ahead of time, but that's not a problem. <laughs> I think it would be uh, we can uh, finish earlier, so we can move to the last uh, talk. Even 
how if uh, we are technically ready. I think that uh, we can start. If you have any problem uh, with uh, following us, please just uh, speak or send something to chat. For in, in the room, everything seems to work. So uh, at the end, uh, I don't have uh, conclusions. We have heard all the uh, the theories that can be applied for describing the observed structures we are speaking about, namely bars and spirals, uh, they have been presented. I will do, of course, the same, but uh, as the title suggests, uh, actually I will uh, present open questions, things that I think are not concluded. Uh, the same, Structure, a bar or a spiral can be modeled, represented, maybe modeled if you want, uh, under several scenarios. And it is very difficult to uh, point to the right one. So it's good to have a, a look in all these uh, possible scenarios and then try to find what will be the, the criteria that will allow us to conclude. So, uh, okay, like, uh, let me, it doesn't change. Have at least one way to, to change the, uh, the transparencies. So galaxies are everywhere. This was a very popular uh, picture in the last uh, month in, uh, in the press when, uh, James Webb Telescope started sending us uh, nice pictures. Galaxies are everywhere. What we are discussing here is uh, the structures that developed, developed in these cases. And uh, from here is a slide I found somewhere on the internet. Uh, the evolution of the objects that we discussed today have ages uh, are within, let's say, 10 billion years. So, the structures that uh, we see in uh, 
around us in the nearby universe uh, are like this, but certainly if we go, go to some older times, there are bars and spirals around, and even in the beginning, something that start looking like uh, bars or spirals out there. Uh, one of, question, of course, is when exactly can we uh, start having morphologies uh, like the galaxies in the nearby universe, which is the time in the past that we have to go back to say that, now here, a bar or a spiral, a bar spiral morphology has been established. Uh, here are our, our friends. Uh, we have uh, some cases where clearly barred, plus the spirals, but which in this case uh, start emerging very close to the end of the bar. Then we have uh, these uh, cases like NGC 2997 here, where we, it's a nice example to, to, to present the fact, if the scale is not the same, but you can understand exactly what is what, uh, that uh, the central regions in the near infrared uh, frequently is different from what we see in the optical, in the nice images that we have used to look at in atlas of galaxies. This is a nice case. This is the, here, the central region, but you see here some kind of dust lanes going all the way almost to the center of the galaxy. Well, here, this is an area occupied by this component here, which we could call a mobile distortion. This is not the project of the image. Okay, and then there is this other kind of, uh, of uh, spiral galaxies which in the optical look uh, like uh, multi-armed or floppulent if you want, but you go in the near infrared and you do some uh, very standard, I would say, uh, image processing, for instance, in this case, but from a paper in 98, uh, what has been done here is actually, okay, to project the image, but then divide by the anaxisymmetric background. And then you see that, what you couldn't call it grand design here is the case here indeed. You have spirals emerging out of a kind of, uh, well, I don't want to call it a ring, but an area uh, tangentially from this round uh, configuration here. And they go, they have a symmetric part somewhere here up, up to uh, in larger distances, there is something that can be of maybe not part of the grand design, but here you have a very constant pinch angle indeed. And this is one of the issues that I will stress also in, uh, in, uh, in other slides uh, uh, later. Uh, look, uh, it is a nice example, have it in mind. Well, uh, it is not an exception. Here you have a multi-arm or flopulent galaxy. Uh, you go to the near infrared, basic image processing, then you get a grand design with a constant pitch angle. Okay. Here it is 2997. And one question that I have heard from people discussing, especially uh, since we have started discussing about chaotic spirals, could all spirals that we see around be chaotic? The Apunophobic stuff, if you want. We, we coined this uh, chaotic spirals, which a, a structure cannot be chaotic. It's a, a, a structure out of chaotic orbits, but we're gonna call it vaguely chaotic spirals. Well, here, do we have an oval distortion? Yes, we do. Here it is. So why not all this stuff? Here it's a grand design thing. Again, a nice case where uh, much of the uh, stuff of in the optical, the structures observed in the optical, uh, it's not present in the near infrared actually i think that uh, also this this branch here uh, is much less pronounced if we compare uh, surface density to what what we see here but in any case here is the oval distortion i'm speaking about it's not a bar but it is not a, a round bulge and then why not this arm and this arm to be the uh, uh products of uh, manifold uh, orbits acting on this uh, so on this galaxy, you help me. Uh, 
dots, but uh, this is actually similar question. If uh, do non-BART uh, galaxies exist in general? The answer is yes, they do. Okay, we do have this, uh, these cases like NGC 1033, okay? There is no bar here. This is in the optical uh, one image that uh, you can find I could find in uh, in the web again. Uh, one some people have done it. Looks around for companions. There are in many cases not obvious companions around, but uh, you have grand design uh, non-bar spiral galaxies. This is usually called normal spiral galaxies. Normal grand design spiral galaxies. They do exist, they do exist. Uh, we have this kind, look here, there is another uh, another case. Uh, and uh, this is NGC 2857. Uh, and uh, actually this is again, a picture of, of a Laplace, but is uh, one of the galaxies we observe in Helmos here in Greece, in Peloponnese. We can make deep observations there by observing, let's say a couple of galaxies per night and then nice features that you don't see on atlases or in pictures out of surveys emerge, and we're gonna use them for building models. We have much better images for that. It's not time to present them, but here it's one more case where you have a grand design non bars para galaxies. But uh, most of the cases, are, we have more like this, like NGC 3223. You go from this in the optical, to something like that in the real infrared. So the question is, okay, they exist. Where are the uh, Lagrangian, the unstable Lagrangian points, if you want, in this case? You cannot put them at the end of some oval distortion here and that uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, kind of morphologies. Equivalent, equivalently, if you want, the question is what is uh, the pattern speed of the spiral in these cases? And uh, well, probably doesn't uh, matter so much uh, to to have or not have a bar as soon as you can define an inner Lindblad resonance. If you have an inner Lindblad, inner Lindblad resonance, then uh, whatever you are interested in is what uh, how does your spiral be behave at larger distances. Here is an extreme example. Uh, this uh, transparency has been used for other purposes. That's why one orbit is presented just to show how uh, a normal precessing ellipse spiral pattern can be uh, reinforced by the orbits of, uh, of, of, of the X1 orbits are these, but not in a bar, in a uh, non bar uh, spiral pattern. But okay, here is the, uh, the inner the resonance of this model. What is this model? This is not a bar spiral case. Here it is a no the response, the orbits, if you want, in a normal. Uh, spiral potential. This is one of, uh, in particular cases, one of uh, uh, the perilous model of the Mexican colleagues. Uh, doesn't matter what is exactly the case. What is uh, uh, nicely described here is that when you cross, uh, so this is one family, X1 family in this particular model. When you cross the inner lunar resonance, then uh, what happens is that the P, I, the P uh, I, as I call it here, the pitch angle, increases abruptly, increases abruptly. So if you want to have a self-consistent model inside here, you have to, to change the pitch angle, but uh, we are speaking about uh, the region in terms of resonances at uh, the inner resonance at, at larger distances. This, however, poses a question. Here you have a bar spiral morphology if you want. You just, uh, for, explain, for talking about the spiral arms, you forget about what is inside here. But here it is something, an, an elongated structure. And uh, for studying in the past, I will also do a little bit of uh, spiral modeling archaeology here. I will go again in the past a bit to show you uh, how uh, we try to, to, to study uh, what happens uh, beyond the inner lunar resonance. Uh, and these are some self-consistent tests that I did for my PhD thesis based on the models that uh, 
Treben, uh, Grossbull, and uh, Professor Contopoulos had de developed in that uh, time, uh, and to show you the results. So there was a kind of self-consistent tests, and these self-consistent tests were uh, comparing three cases, actually. In two of them, the end of the spiral arms, and I will come to this point to explain it better, was the, the, the corrotation, and in the third case was the four to one resonance. Now, this end of the spiral pattern has added a lot of confusion. We tried for years to explain, we speak about the symmetric part, the symmetric part of a model, not of a galaxy, of a model of a galaxy, we want, since we want to compare them with galaxies at the end. And in, uh, uh, in the first corrotation model, the amplitude was low. The, in the other corrotation model, the amplitude was large. And since, as you see in the two upper panels here, they failed somehow, so this is the, the ratio between the imposed and the re response densities for the models, as explained by Contopoulos this morning. And uh, here is the end of the symmetric part of the spiral arc, let's say. You see that in both cases, we have some troubles. Whenever the third assumption was uh, made, saying that, uh, let's say that this end of the symmetric spiral is farther in a little bit, closer to the uh, uh, center of the galaxy, we have a noise here outside, uh, then it, things work better. So you had something here that was uh, much better, at least from the other two cases. And the models that we could uh, construct were like this for the case of M51 as we see here. So, especially the, the, the comparison of the phases reflected in this density map uh, was in very good comparison with the, the projected uh, image of the galaxy. Not only uh, the symmetric part was in the right place, but we could get this feature that by that time, I haven't heard that so much being called like this, the elbows of the arms, as they were saying, were present there and even Look at these bifurcations, and since they're not random, it was not the only case we could see features like that. So definitely this case worked better than the two others, but this was for open spirals. You see that I have them, I have it here with uh, yellow. Uh, open spirals were following this criteria. When we went to earlier type, these galaxies, like the SA galaxies, Okay, let me summarize, uh, I went a slide. So here it is, I summarize again this, uh, what I described before. Spirals rotate slowly, how slowly? That slowly as to bring the end of the symmetric part of the spiral arms of this grand design spiral arms are the four to one resonance and before corrotation. Uh, off phase extensions, you will see that uh, later may, uh, reach corrotation, and the forcing here was uh, in the range that already has been discussed, five to twelve percent. This was the values between uh, for twelve galaxies that we had studied by that time. Uh, and what were the the orbits that were making the nice models? They were basically quasi periodic orbits uh, trapped around X one orbits, quasi periodic orbits, and the, this particular quasi-periodic orbits considered uh, gave also nice uh, relations comparing the velocity dispersions. So probably we could increase or decrease a little bit, but there were particular, let's say, imagine a Poincaré surface of section at a certain energy, then you went to invariant curves not that far away from the periodic orbits. We're going to see that. So uh, quasi-periodic orbits compatible with the dispersion velocity for the model. We didn't overdo that to go in the chaotic seas around or in sticky orbits, etc. No, we work with quasi-periodic orbits. Now, the slides that I urged to speak about was this one, when we have tightly wound spirals now, not open spirals, then 
this restriction was not uh, necessary. I mean that when we had a very closed uh, spiral, so this is one of the galaxies of that sample, NGC 488, the projected, this, uh, we had estimated the pitch angle to be one degree, let's say. Then the uh, four to one resonance phenomena, you have seen the, uh, the figures that uh, Professor Kondopoulos has shown this morning, uh, they were not that severe. So uh, patterns could go through that and then uh, you didn't need also to go to even to 5%. 1% of the perturbation was enough to have acceptable uh, relations with uh, the model, with the observations or whatever you wanted, uh, following similar uh, tests. Uh, again, basically quasi-periodic orbits trapped around the X1 family. And again, one of the criteria was that they were compatible with the standard observed dispersion of velocities. Well, here is a nice example. Then in the years that followed, we went also to study the uh, gases responses, but we used and we mainly use SPH uh, uh, modeling Recently, we had uh, a nice uh, paper with uh, Stavos Pastras, who is in the audience here, and for his uh, master thesis and uh, Lia Thanasula, we used other codes as well. Uh, they gave uh, very uh, close results to what we see with SPH. Now, for a paper from 97 here, this is a, uh, a nice uh, observation that Preben got with uh, Hokai in VLT. This is the galaxy. Here's a deprojected optical image of the galaxy. And we did our assumption. So it's like betting. They say, if we consider that this is the, uh, the potential that represents the galaxy with this pitch angle, and if this is the rotation curve, in this case, we had some additional assumptions and M equal one component to make the asymmetry. What would be the response and how does the response compare with the galaxy? Of course, we did again, other assumptions that the four to one modeling, like corrotation, the outer lambda resonance, whatever uh, was matching the galaxy was this assumption again. And look here, we are quite uh, satisfied because we have the symmetric part of, uh, of the galaxy, B1, between B1 and B2, between B, this is the model, this is the galaxy, B1 and B2. Then we have the bifurcations here on the arms of the four to one, this nice extension from one side towards corrotation, this I3 thing that it is here, it's a good matching, not perfect, but it's a good matching. And then, of course, we continue looking at this uh, stuff and try to reproduce that also with body simulations. What is this now here? I have a note, but you don't see that. Okay. Uh, the, it would be nice if we could find some initial conditions where similar morphologies appear in, in body simulations. And then if they appear, we are interested up to, to see how long they last. It is not obvious. It is not the, the first thing that you do when you start uh, an end body simulation from a, a systematic uh, disk populated, then you get a bar. It is difficult to avoid getting the bar, and it's even more difficult to get grand design spirals. And the, uh, one step further in the difficulty is to, to have grand designs that last. We're working on that. I will show you just one case because it is similar to what we see in this galaxy. We have a 30 degrees, as is the pitch angle of this galaxy. In this case, it is similar to that one, has a nice, extension uh, after the symmetric part. It is a very nice feature here that uh, it, this is uh, in some, well, it is difficult to see something here, but in any case, there are these uh, interarm region features that it is nice to see that exist over there, uh, bifurcations before we end the uh, end of the symmetric spirals, all nice uh, stuff. It is a similar situation. That's why I'm just uh, um, presenting it here. 
Okay, we were not the only ones, however, that uh, were finding and are finding maybe a uh, nice comparison with observations under the assumption that the end of the symmetric spirals is at the four to one resonance. Or if you want a more general statement is that uh, normal spirals, non-barred, non-strongly barred, if you want there, we start uh, putting a little bit discussion, uh, are nicer if they rotate slowly. They reach corrotation, which is needed in many, in all theories, almost about spiral structure, but the comparison is better under this assumption. And uh, one of those uh, studies that I wanted to show you is something is from Tilo Kranz, 2003, almost 20 years ago. You see that uh, here, uh, uh, the circles here are uh, corrotations. And for instance, in this case, you can have a symmetric spiral uh, part. You see here that is an end of a spiral go the way through the center of the galaxy, you see that this one, this one is more or less symmetric than the symmetry breaks. The same here, the same there, et cetera, et cetera. So all these patterns do not reach corrotation and the fourth one is close to the symmetric end of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, spiral arms. Actually, uh, they have done one test more than what we did in this uh, series of papers. They had also long slit spectroscopy and they were uh, seeing com in comparison that these their nicer models had better comparison in, under this assumption with this kind of velocity, uh, not maps, but fields that they could register. Okay. Okay. Uh, beyond the four to one resonance, uh, you have heard that we change paradigm and then Already by the time we were dealing with this non barred spiral galaxy, et cetera, we had some indications uh, we didn't discuss, simply we didn't discuss. Here is one of the case, one of the models that were built for 2997 actually, but it's not the purpose to, to compare this with that one. I'm just mainly, uh, I want to, to show you that, look, this one was, Uh, when uh, is at ESO time. Uh, so this is the in the spiral that we have. Supposedly the spiral up to here, up to this break of the of the arm. In this case, uh, regular orbits, precession ellipses can support such a structure. And then because we had populated our SPH model, this is gas uh, to larger distances, another set of arms were emerging here you have a gap here it's the amplitude clearly if you look at the color bar between is uh, smaller but you have some extensions like that today we certainly identify these objects these uh, spirals with chaotic spirals we didn't had discuss about that time and let, let's see what here uh, the question that, uh, uh, the first question that I want to, to raise to, to, to give to the audience for discussion is the one that you see here. If all spirals at the ends of bars are chaotic, so we see a bar galaxy, nice continuation to uh, spiral arms. Is, are there, in all cases, are these chaotic spirals? Uh, chaotic spirals, of course, can be uh, easier studied in BART galaxy, BART spirals, galaxies, than in normal spirals because of the stronger forcing. Here we have an unbody model. Here the dust lanes are there. Nice continuation of the, of, uh, of the density, of the higher density regions, and an arm, if you want. Uh, after the end of the bar, it is in all cases this, at least in all cases, at the end of bars, chaotic. There are cases where we say no, because for instance, look here, this is uh, from a paper uh, uh, with Leah, again, 22 years ago. Uh, this is a simple 
uh, Ferrer's bar model in very good agreement with the, the code that uh, she had the famous paper of 92 with all the, the responses. The Lagrangian points of these models are at six kiloparsecs and somewhere here close to that are by eye, I put it somewhere here. It's not there in any case, but a rotating bar uh, does leave traces, which could be uh, called spiral arcs or spiral arms. And you see this response model even gives here some empty regions. One would say, oh, here, look, here is the area where the Lagrangian, the, the stable Lagrangian point, L4 and 5 are located. But they are not, because here is the Lagrangian point. Roughly now we would say that, okay, they are never in the same. Of course, since we are barred, we have non axisymmetric models that are not in the same radius, but they would be somewhere here. So this is farther inwards. On the other case, in the case of uh, this galaxy that has been also presented uh, this morning, L1 is at the end of the bar, and these are certainly chaotic spirals. So how can we distinguish in real galaxies like that? Let me show you a little bit more about this kind of uh, uh, chaotic spiral stuff in some models. Uh, what has been done is that uh, in a few at least cases, we don't have many. We hope to have in the near future more on that. Uh, we have used uh, potentials estimated uh, from near infrared observations, not from us, uh, from other uh, uh, colleagues and collaborators in some cases. In one case, it is was by us for NGC 1300, but uh, 4314 was from Alice Quillen, 3359 by Vera Bunisai, who has been disappeared, he was doing his thesis at uh, Florida uh, Gainesville University and in the academy here. But in any case, this is the kind of uh, potentials we test uh, this uh, th this orbits, these chaotic orbits, which have, of course, the uh, disadvantage not to be able to go very far away from the bar. But in any case, here uh, we have. Uh, found out that this is chaotic spirals indeed. And this is the kind of orbits that support it. So you see that we that there are orbits that for some times support the chaotic, they support the envelope of the arm. We have studied that with Leah uh, a few years earlier uh, than, uh, uh, well, many years earlier than this paper, right? About 96, 97, I don't remember. But we didn't go beyond the Lagrangian points we have just the envelopes. If you continue for some energies integrating these orbits more, then they go outside corrotation. And then by doing this, they support uh, uh, these spirals. And we did that also later for, with uh, uh, a model, let's say for uh, 1300. And just look at this. Here you have some loops, etc. And also in the previous one, you could see that it is a, you have boxy-like features. So it is the four to one resonance also here again. So these are chaotic orbits that have a four to one resonant character, and they go uh, if they are integrated for long times beyond corrotation. And by doing the, uh, this, they reinforce spiral features that are. Uh, following the bar to structure. So uh, if one goes uh, there, can also uh, find manifolds for this, because these orbits are, uh, are, are always, um, uh, they, they have a small stable part, but uh, actually mostly they are again unstable. There are sticky orbits, etc. And we can find the manifolds, and if the energy is uh, beyond the energy of Lagrangian points, they escape. Here it's from a figure that he had back to 2013 with Liana Cigaridi, also in the audience, from her thesis. And this is uh, the, the figure that uh, Mirella has shown you before. We call that uh, 56, NGC 56 type response. It's not a, a model for this particular galaxy, but uh, the, the structure that uh, uh, we obtain in this kind of models can we can say that has this archetype this galaxy as archetype so we have a well developed 
spiral structure in here. We have, uh, I think Preben has shown one uh, near infrared image of this galaxy. Here we have nice uh, grand design. This is not, again, it's nearly the projected, but okay, the particular image has not been corrected for this small effect. Uh, nice uh, grand design spirals in K prime, which is included in a kind of an oval that you see here, which can be considered a kind of a bar. And then you have the Lagrangian points in the model and the spirals. And the first thing one uh, has in mind is, OK, in the same way, somewhere here and there, there are the Lagrangian points, and we have the spiral arms. I repeat that this one here is a, a well-developed spiral structure, grand design in the near infrared. Here we have star formation, et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, if you just look in images in this galaxy, you do not Im can imagine what's going to follow. It's not the only object. There are a few, but it is not the only. Let me show you one more. Here is 5248, MGC 5248. I hope you can see it somehow. Here is the oval of this galaxy, and here and there are the uh, uh, outer spirals, if you want. And again, one assumption is that somewhere here is the Lagrangian point goes out. Okay, uh, so we have two different flows. Maybe they can be combined. One, we're trying to find observational criteria. Well, one uh, case is that uh, if we can see something in the pitch angles. So for instance, in this case, in this model, Corotation is where in the left side, if you look here is the, this circle here is the corotation, Lagrangian points is here and there. This is all the chaotic spirals. This is, the, this is the flow. And uh, uh, if you try to see uh, if this, how can one describe these spirals? Then it is not that easy to just find one single logarithmic spiral with two, it is better. Uh, this is uh, certainly a different situation than what we see here. So here we have a, a grand design pattern where all the way to the end of the symmetric part, we have one and the same pitch angle. So, well, here there is a difference. I again say that this kind of objects are not that rare. There are many optically local or multi-armed that they end up to a grand design in the near infrared. Let, let me tell you a little bit more about this kind of, of flows. Here is the standard uh, uh, paradigm, if you want, one can have in the density wave theory. Corrotation is the black circle here. We have these ellipses that are come, come this way. They stay more time and the spiral, potential minima, density maxima, whatever you want to call the red stuff, the red spiral, it's a logarithmic spiral. And when you cross correlation, one has in mind that just like in the uh, case of uh, the sketch that Professor Kontopoulos has shown this morning, is go the same way uh, around the galaxy in the opposite direction now, clockwise. So in that sense, in this kind of description, here you would say have, uh, if it was gas, it would be compressed uh, somewhere here. You would have a dust lens and young objects there. And the opposite would be here, compression, young object, the dust lane, young objects on the other side. We don't see these things. And the point is that as we have seen and we have heard in other talks, uh, if you cross correlation and you find spirals, like those that I have shown you before, then instead of, having this kind of flow, at least for uh, in, within a ring, then the flow will go this way. And this, one has to have this in mind. Does it, can we say that this is, can be reflected in the kinematics? I remember the time that uh, kind of uh, Kansian and some other, the, our friends in Russia were trying by, uh, kinematic methods to point to corrotation of uh, normal uh, spiral patterns. And uh, 
I, I will not repeat now the the, the criteria uh, that uh, I think people in the audience know and those that are following us. But look what we have here. This is one of the cases like uh, before. So we have a correlation that the symmetric part of the spiral, the strong M equal two, is not uh, reaching. Then this is not seen very well here, but you have other parts that go towards correlation. But if you apply the method, then what you would see is that at a certain point, you have an M equal one in the residual fields now, I'm speaking about Kantian like methods. In the residual field, you have an M equal one turn to M equal three. And according to the rule of this method, then you cross correlation. However, this is a trap because you cross the four to one resonance. You don't have an M equal two, you have an M equal four pattern. And then by subtracting one, you go to the M equal three pattern that you see. So here is a, at least a trap. And I don't know if we take into account the other kind of flow, if we still can uh, follow the change in the radial velocity sign so that we can trace things like that. And indeed, it doesn't, op let me see. Not all keys work on this laptop, but here we have this model the one that I have shown you before. And here, I'm not sure that one can uh, can uh, speak about uh, an effective way of applying this kind of methods. So let's have that in mind. Uh, let me proceed. Are there more candidate case with order and chaos coexisting? Uh, I'm always, uh, well, there are papers, uh, uh, that very nicely reproduce inner rings with manifolds. I'm not sure that this is at least in all cases. Uh, first of all, uh, inner rings can be nicely reproduced by regular orbits. Here is an example uh, with uh, uh, Skokos, Harris Kokos, and Leah Thanasula from that time. Uh, I have it here because in this particular case, uh, this ring reproduces this nice four to one and six to one features that if one looks carefully in some inner rings can be seen. But also in this case that I have, I don't recall the NGC number of the galaxy, excuse me right now. I think it's, I have taken one of uh, Buddha's papers probably. Uh, here we have a ring, but then the, 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 uh, the arm, the spiral arm, as we can see, starts over there. So I would expect that the Lagrangian point should be over there. So how can it uh, also form the, let's say the chaotic spiral, uh, the, 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 the Japun of orbits can also uh, build this structure. May, maybe in some cases, uh, this, uh, this can be of, uh, made of regular orbits. So certainly this is a different case. Look here, for instance, here we have a bar and at the end of the bars, we have a, a strong part that emerges out of the end of the bar, it doesn't be this as uh, bright as the, the spiral arm, the outer ring in this case, whatever. Here is much less bright than it is there, the same on the other arm. But in any case, if, and I guess this is a nice case for chaotic spiral cases, the Lagrangian points should be very close to the end of this bar. Here, it cannot be said the same. So, uh, and having all, seen all that stuff, one question that should be carefully addressed by people also that have also experience in star formation, hydrodynamics, etc., is what about star formation along chaotic spirals? How can we explain the relative location of dust lanes and, excuse me for the young objects uh, along them? So, Maybe we can see another uh, image, but here there are dust lanes in the inner part of these arms. So here there are dust lanes. In some cases, are much stronger. Uh, okay, could have chosen a better example, but I'm sure you have seen that. So, but on the other hand, we say that if we expect uh, accept chaotic flows, more or less, the flow is along the spiral arms, and in the gas, it is like going in a tube somehow. Can we have Again, dust lanes 
in the inner, in the sense of rotation, part of these spirals, this is a nice thing to be modeled. And more questions. Here again, you have seen all these figures like in the morning. This, uh, this was the most popular of the one day workshop, I think. But uh, okay, this is what uh, uh, Dave and Professor Kondopoulos uh, proposed for, well, they didn't propose, they had a, they had a problem. I remember the, the times. They were trying desperately to find regular orbits in the region and they couldn't. And that's why they had to accept that, okay, we're gonna use the chaotic orbits for bridging actually the regular stuff and the regular stuff existed like this look in this particular uh, it was for an, i think uh, uh, for a galaxy that we have seen also this uh, in another token of christos i think has shown uh, this 3992 okay the outer parts of this galaxy were reinforced by this minus two to one kind of orbits and you see that here you can indeed have material come from outside the spiral shock and get inside and in this way produce of course in this case the dust lens would be on the opposite side but in any case here there is a regular family that could help uh, in principle uh, in uh, supporting the spiral structure uh, if it was populated but i'm again uh, i am again coming to the question if we need this uh, orbits or not to have a nicely uh, described uh, uh, spiral structure azimuthically all the way, at least 180 degrees from the Lagrangian point they emerge. And okay, let me also mention this other family. It is, uh, our, uh, it is related with the families at the uh, stable Lagrangian points. It's not the, the typical one. It's not uh, an, uh, uh, let's say, asymmetric uh, banana-like orbit. It's in one of other family, rather obscured, because in most cases, uh, the members of this family, like the last one here, uh, does not intersect either of the axes, so it's difficult to find. But in any case, exist also other families that if we, you consider they could support the outer parts of, of the arm. So here is the question. Do we need them or can we exclude them? One more strange situation. <laughs> we speak about chaotic spirals. Can we speak also about chaotic bars? Chaotic bars, you would say, how can you have chaotic bars? This is uh, a nice example that I, I like to present it. it. It is a surprise, still it is a surprise for me. Usually we get an analytic uh, for making orbital structures. We get an analytic, nice analytic, uh, uh, nicely behaving analytic potential so that we in the old time was caring also about nicely uh, calculated uh, second derivatives, but in many cases now we don't have this, these problems. And we thought that by, let's say, uh, varying the pattern speed, we just scale a basic We lost you, Panos. Um, Panos, repeat. We lost for the last part. Okay. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I got an. Uh, also, excuse me for that. I got the the note. Uh, internet connection is unstable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I'm saying that. Uh, from the beginning, I was saying that uh, usually we take uh, some uh, well-behaving pot analytic potentials, and when uh, for the effective ISO potentials by varying the pattern speed, at least I was thinking that we just scale a morphology. So you just push it, uh, re you reduce the omega pattern, you push outside the Lagrangian points, but the shape of the ISO potentials would remain the same. When we estimated uh, a potential for NGC 1300, but it doesn't matter. It's not uh, if it is related nicely to the galaxy or not, which had all kinds of peculiar features. Like, uh, as you see, in the upper part has three L1s. Uh, 
at the bottom has just one L2 and things like that. And uh, okay, yeah, it is one L4 and one L5, but okay. Uh, when we started varying the pattern speed, the shape of the ISO, uh, of the ISO contours of the effective potential was also changing. And at a certain range of values, we got an answer type ISO contours of the effective potential. And then we when we uh, tried to get the response of this model, then we have seen this one is not our best model for 1300. It's, uh, we have a complicated, we propose something complicated for this galaxy. But in any case, forget about the galaxy. Look at the model. You have an answer type bar and some spiral structures over there. And this is for that, uh, the bar of the galaxy was perfectly uh, reproduced. You see here, this is the contours of the, of, this is the ISO surface brightness ISO contours of the galaxy on top of the model. Fails getting the spirals, has its own, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't care about uh, getting the, the spirals of the galaxy, the model, but the bar is very nicely there. And this bar, is what we found here. The point is that this is a, a bar that practically is out of chaotic orbits. So there is the shape is not uh, by trapping of orbits around stable periodic uh, uh, orbits of X1, for instance, but it is because it is the allowed at the, at the various energies, the allowed space, the uh, in phase space that can be populated. So it's like having a fly going uh, here. And by doing this, it remains in the predefined area. So orbits like this, I have shown you before. So uh, there is, if there is an X1 family with the stable uh, orbits, yes, there is one. Uh, it reaches, I think, something like that in here. All the rest is made of these chaotic orbits. One more question. If we can have chaotic, allow me to use this term, bars. Okay, so let's go to three dimensions now a bit, just for a presentation. It is the last talk, you're tired but maybe you would like to hear something also about some things, some questions that I think that they are still open in peanuts or at least there are discussions. Maybe I believe in one of the scenario, but other believe in different scenario. So here is a nice peanut, as you have seen this nice uh, 4710 and GC 4710 galaxy. And uh, also, I want to show you what we see in our telescope in uh, <laughs> in Helmos. An ideal inclination uh, have we found there for a galaxy and the C3, uh, 352, 352, with the Aristarchos telescope. The nice inclination allowed us to have simultaneously on our image the X, the thin part of the bar, and the spirals. And we got also uh, a central spiral structure that will be studied separately. Okay, uh, so assessing the role of the families of periodic orbits for that one, this is what we propose. Uh, mainly I have the transparency for the central figure, which shows the way in a side on view of a model, how the, uh, vertical bifurcations of X1, these we call X1 V1 family, uh, are arranged. So at their upper centers here, uh, they stay longer time, and so they can reinforce the X. There is another family of unstable orbits. Uh, they play the same role. Stickiness makes also again the trick we had shown that in the paper with Mirella a few years ago. So this is what, uh, well, actually, I believe that it is the case uh, that uh, mainly um, supports the, uh, the peanuts. And uh, Christos, I thought that in the simulation that we have shown during the morning, you had also 
these nice bumps that, <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. So that, that, that's, we have to, to look at it. Uh, and uh, however, there are other groups that believe that uh, orbits, we would say of higher multiplicity that close in uh, more than one revolution around the center of the galaxy could play the role. So with Leah, we studied all this family. So at least to know what we are speaking about and where they are coming from. And here I just have one transparency to show you what ca other kind of uh, stuff could be proposed as building blocks, things like that. And I remember is in one of the cases, look at this as well. And uh, uh, well, uh, one of the things that these theories have to overcome is if you take many of these orbits and you do an arrangement one within the other, as I did before for X1 uh, V1, do you get the morphology? This has to be studied. Also, again, one has to, to be careful about the, you remember in the two dimensional models, I was speaking about the dispersion of velocities. So how far away can you go from the periodic orbit you consider? This more than uh, one multiplicity orbits are in a way children of fix one. They are other families, of course. They are not direct bifurcations that we find in the stability diagrams are of uh, second generations, like Poincare was saying, uh, orbits. Uh, but if you consider a surface of section, the real question is how far away from the initial condition of the periodic orbits you can deviate so that you get something that you can get as building block. And if you have young objects, even if they are sticky, they don't have the time to change morphology. And uh, in these simulations that we're doing with Torsten, and I have shown in preparation, 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 so many <laughs> uh, figures, uh, the, 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 the green uh, stuff, there are objects uh, stars that have been born after the beginning of the simulation. And then you see that they do very much uh, they are the, 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 the peanut. So the, it seems that they probably, do they have the time to, to get, uh, uh, to have higher dispersion of velocities? Can this structure sustain over there? A few slides more before I close. Here. Let me tell you about uh, some uh, thoughts about inner boxiness, face on boxes in, in the bars, but we are speaking about the inner boxiness. Uh, you will see later one, I show you here some uh, characteristic uh, orbits and arrangement of orbits. Sometimes you get also a circular ring around that stuff in some cases. And again, here is the same question practically, you have the, the periodic orbit, how far away can you go from the center of the island? And if you consider of larger and larger dispersion orbits, if you, cons if you deviate from the periodic orbit, then you go to towards uh, uh, the outer uh, invariant curves around the periodic orbits or to the chaotic sea, and then a very nice example like that is in the inner Lipland resonant regions where you have uh, multiplicity two and multiplicity three orbits. Very interesting objects. Uh, even a recent paper with Leah and people from China, we study their effect. The point is that if you consider, if you forget about the elliptical ring-like quasi-periodic orbits of the nearby invariants of X1, varying from model to model, which will be the last invariant like this, then you go and you get boxy features like this one, like that one, etc. And where are they? I told you before that this uh, uh, Poincaré section is close to inner resonance. You're correctly, you can imagine that they will be closer to the center. So here is with Manthos, we had some a paper several years ago so is this stuff that it will be represented here? We try to emphasize that by applying some smoothing filters. This red stuff here in the center are, uh, is by uh, 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 orbits that are uh, farther away. We have selected orbits farther away on the... Uh, and this can be combined in some cases with the peanut. So you could try to see if you have 
double boxiness. Here's some a case from Peter who was here in the morning. Uh, some galaxies that have inner boxiness. Uh, they can be or can be or not related with uh, the uh, the edge on peanut. And here is just one example for this. Here you can see that this phason structure can be combined with this x1 v2 I would call shape. If you look uh, from above, this will be an ellipse. So in this case, they wouldn't. But in that case, or in that case, we can speak about double boxiness. So I'm coming to the end. So questions, 11 questions that I mentioned uh, during my talk, I let them there. If uh, you want us to discuss one of them, I don't repeat them. You see them on the, on the, uh, the screen. Thank you very much. Questions, I'll be happy to answer. Here in the audience, yeah, Christmas first. Uh, we, we follow the, excuse me, we follow the uh, first to see who is in, uh, in here who wants to ask something as we get rid of them. <laughs> we go to the guest. <laughs> so please, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I would like just to need a comment. I mean, this program that you showed is essentially a materialization of Poincaré's ideal that for every structure that you observe, there are underlying periodic orbits. I mean, would you think that there is, there is room? I mean, this is always the answer. I mean, it's always through the periodic orbits. Are there structures that could not be due to the periodic orbits themselves? Well, it's a good question, Christos. Uh, remember, well, uh, remember, you have not heard that. There was also a time that people didn't speak at all about orbits for uh, uh, explaining uh, the structures in galaxies. Uh, well, periodic orbits, well, if you think that you have a rotating potential, the periodic orbits will be there. They're coming together with this assumption. Right? So, in that respect, uh, if you have orbits, there will be also underlying periodic orbits. No, periodic orbits per se, of course, will be never. There is not a single periodic orbit in a real galaxy. But uh, uh, the way they structure the phase space and uh, offering all these kind of invariant uh, curves, uh, invariant manifolds, uh, sticky orbits, all that stuff in a way has to do with families of periodic orbits, right? I believe that uh, uh, if you orbital theory and periodic orbits cannot be separated. Uh, this this is my comment. So, uh, yeah, Peter, I, I see, I'm told that you want to ask something. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, very interesting talk. I just wanted to comment on your your very last point about inner face on boxiness, which is I have seen basically zero evidence for that in real galaxies, unless you're talking about some low mass galaxies where the bar, where there seems to be sort of a single vaguely boxy shaped bar. But for example, the, the two examples that you showed from my work, those are one, not really face on, they're moderately inclined. And two, the morphology there is, we thought was perfectly explainable as just the projection of the box peanut. There's no we see them there. again with the one. I'm sorry, this is Peter. Uh, the two that I have shown you. Uh, wait, when I bring the slide. Yes, please. Th this one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what 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 we're indicating, what we indicated there with the red arrows, is what we think is the projection of the box peanut. Period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just that these these are relatively small boxy peanut bulges in terms of the overall bar size. That's all that we think is, is unusual about them. And again, these are not faced, these are probably of inclinations of 40 or 50 degrees. Sure, sure. Uh, Peter, I, I'm, I'm not saying something different, essentially. The only thing I, I point out, they occupy the same area in any case. You see that in the center where the boxy peanut is. I just wanted to point out that you can have in face on views 
boxy features that can be either double boxy, as the case that you mentioned, and this could be something like that. Well, my, my point is, is, is I don't think those two galaxies. Here, uh, in this case, most of the panels show double boxes. So there are the peanuts, is the projection of the peanut. Yes. But as an exception, I just show the one that is one of the families that makes the peanut. And it is boxy, as you can see in the first column. But if, if you would, uh, uh, if you had a structure made of these orbits and you were looking face on, in this particular line, it would be so round. That, that's what I, I'm saying. In most of the cases, there is double boxing. So the projection of the peanut is another way for saying, for saying the same thing. I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Uh, please, please. I'm, I'm in, uh, intrigued by the first question that you listed. First question that you listed. Yes. The question is, if all spirals beyond the ends of the bars are chaotic. No, no, no. Are there non barred spirals? The first fourth. question. The fourth? First, first question, number one. Oh, the first. <laughs> <laughs> Are the, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. What is, I mean, is it that we don't see it? I mean, I feel like there are lots of non bird spiral galaxy. Why is it that you're saying? Why is it a question? First of all, it is difficult to find, yes. Grand design, non bird spiral galaxies. Uh, you have to, to try to find. I found a few and I have shown you. It is not that if you look carefully, then you will see that in most cases, and this increases very much in uh, the near infrared, there are some structures in the center that could be described easily as uh, oval distortions, like in the case of 2997 I was showing. It's, it's the, the most frequent case. But indeed, there are some others where there is no bar, or at least we don't see that, or we don't find the companion around, etc. Uh, there are, uh, my answer is positive. I mean, there are non barred grand design spiral galaxies. It's not the most frequently structure that you can find in the sky, but yes, they, they do exist, I believe. Yes, please, Christos. But actually, that brings a very interesting question because you can add to that. Are there, let's say, normal spirals that have no companions or that you can claim that the spiral structure itself was not generated by the interaction with the environment? Do you find anyone that you could positively claim that it is isolated enough so as not to need, let's say, the environment for causing the spiral structure? I isolated from the environment, I believe there is no galaxy that has been developed. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Not... if you have an object there for let's say five giga years without a companion, if if it exists, right? So my question, if it exists and you don't see any obvious at least companion, okay, you have to uh, only in this way. Only in this way, I can say I couldn't find an obvious companion that create, but it may exist. And this, uh, I have shown two examples. Maybe there are more. If it could be somehow sustained for a long time, it's as as of there was no companion. Let's say in that sense. But of course, all of the galaxies had you know, at the beginning interaction with the environment. The point is what they did after they had a kind of, uh, not relaxation in that sense, they have uh, not uh, any more strong uh, influence from the environment. So you don't have, uh, even M51, I, have, I don't remember now the paper that they, they were claiming that uh, the, the largest part of it doesn't feel the companion, it's just the tidal arm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's a very difficult question in a way. I agree with everything you said, Panos, but it's not an easy question to, to look at because, first of all, you don't care that much about big things. You, the smaller but nearer things are much more interesting for creating structures like spirals and, and bars. Then the other point is that sometimes they're behind the object, you're, the main galaxy. So you'd have to do proper photometry and look at the symmetric part to make sure that there is a blob, blob there or not. And then the, the third thing or fourth thing, I can't remember, was that the, um, the, 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 it's not what you see today, but if there was a trajectory that brought it near and hit the galaxy, then it goes relatively further away. That's enough. So you don't have to look at only the present position, but the past positions. It's really a, a mess of a story. It, it is very difficult to, to say that. But as I said, uh, OK, uh, do we care of, I mean, if there is an oval distortion or not in the center, only if we are favor the scenario that all the spirals are chaotic, which could be, it's a, it's, a, it's a possibility. If we don't, uh, then we speak about something that extends beyond an inner leap that resonance. Then you see that in the, uh, so you forget the, the structure. Okay, if you do, of course, it can be, have a different pattern speed, things like that. But if you speak about the, the structure of a mode, let's say, that is beyond the inner lindal resonance, then, uh, okay, this can be combined with an oval distortion with, or, uh, with different or even with the same pattern speed. For instance, I, I have shown you this model for M51. It works under the assumption. It gives you something that compares well with the galaxy. Now, if it's correct or not, well, at least this test go, at least goes through this test. Maybe we can find other tests where this does not, and then we. Hmm. Yes, I agree. Yeah, just to rephrase, let's say this is correct the remark, but I would say essentially the question is what excites the spiral and how periodic this could be or how recurrent this could be. So let's say you have a disk in which there are instabilities, there are modes that could grow within the disk, just generated by the disk. Mm -hmm. And then you have all the environment that can cause other stuff, or could, you could even imagine a triaxial halo acting like I say. You can imagine many mechanisms that could just excite. So whenever we say we see, I mean, how how let's say acute is the problem of understanding the origin of spiral structure in those normal, in particular galaxies? I mean, are they mostly due to the disks, let's say, self-driving of instabilities, or are they mostly triggered by one or the other way by an environment? I think that this is a question that is quite crucial, probably, in this list. Sure, yeah. Uh, any other comments, questions? No? So then, uh, let me close this microphone here and go to the podium. So uh, I want to thank you, all of you, uh, very much. Those that we are here and those that have followed us from everywhere around the world. I was very glad to see several names on the screen, I hope. I hope in better days so that we can meet in person and uh, have uh, one of the large meetings that we used to have some 15 or more uh, uh, years ago. Uh, I think that there's uh, a lot of things to discuss and uh, work together uh, on uh, on these issues. If uh, if some if you have some good ideas for all these questions, I'll be happy to read. Also, your send me an email, or uh, it's very nice to discuss them with all, all of you all this stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.
Cazzo, è un po' più, 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 è un po'